Okay, we're going to get started this morning with an invocation from Pastor Mark Johnson of Crossroads Church, uh, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman David Greenwell. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning recognizing your sovereignty, recognizing your will and purpose over this whole earth. Your word says that life and death rest in the tongue. So I pray that as business is conducted today, issues are discussed. I pray that you would give wisdom to the men and the women who are presiding over the business that takes place. I pray that your will would be advanced. Lord, I pray for protection over Oklahoma and her people. Uh, this week, protection from weather, protection for, uh, for their homes and their property. Lord, we know that you love humanity equally. You love including nations, states, countries, and municipalities. But we pray today that you would love Oklahoma and Oklahoma City a little bit more and bless us today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Man. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and we have a couple presentations under Office of the Mayor, item three on the agenda, and I will make my way to the front, and we will uh, handle those. And actually, uh, why don't we start with the Southeast soccer team, and why don't you guys go ahead and make your way to the front, and just line up right here in front of the podium while I get up there. Councilman Todd Stone and I and everybody else here at City Hall, we're very excited. Uh, a, uh, a couple weeks ago when the news came through that you guys had won, but we want to learn a little bit about uh, more about that journey to the championship that you had recently, and so I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas the Southeast Spartans varsity boys soccer team defeated Fort Gibson 3-1 to one to take the title in the Class 4A boys state championship, the first in school's history. And whereas the title game win denied Fort Gibson's three-peat attempt. And whereas the team finished the season on an 11-game win streak, finishing with a record of 16-1-1. One, and, one. and whereas the Spartans made it to the title game by defeating Community Christian 2-0, Mount St. Mary 4-1, Clinton 4-2, and Holland Hall 3-2. Whereas this title comes for Coach Garen Park in his first ever season as a head coach and in his second year of teaching. He was also named 2019 All-State 4A Soccer Coach of the Year. Southeast Assistant Soccer Coach Gustavo Urbani, a member of the 2014 State Runner-Up Southeast Soccer Team, is a class of 2016 Southeast Spartan graduate and is a senior at Mid-American Christian University. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby congratulate Southeast High School on winning the 2019 Class 4A Boys State Soccer Championship. Thank you. Yeah, let's hear it for these guys. I want to thank Councilman Todd Stone for, uh, for making sure all this happened, and I would love to hear a few words. I'm sure we all would, Councilman. 
Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to reiterate again how uh, proud of you guys we all are. Uh, fantastic season. And I, I honestly, I feel a little sorry for the coach because now, I mean, he's got to win it every year to keep the record going. <laughs> so, uh, but again, we're proud of you guys. And, uh, you know, cherish this moment. It's something that you'll carry with you the rest of your life. So, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman Stone. And uh, we've got the, uh, the undefeated Coach Garen Park, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words. And feel free to introduce anybody, too, that, you, that you'd like to. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's always good for us um, to see the community support, city support behind uh, what our boys are working for. Um, I know that they uh, definitely won this one for their community, uh, for Southeast. Uh, always like to represent well. Um, seniors, if you could raise your hand to give them a wave. These are the boys that were sent in off this year. Um, so big congratulations to them. Uh, we have at least four that have committed to play soccer in college. Uh, all at Southwestern, and I'm pretty sure more to come. So thank you for having us again. Yeah, thank you, Coach. Appreciate yeah. you. Uh, and why don't we adopt this resolution? I'm guessing uh, you'll move it. Uh, second. <laughs> second. Uh, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you guys so much. We're so proud of you. Congratulations. That's how they win that soccer stuff, I'm to understand. Short and quick. It's still true. That. You guys want to come up here? Got one more this morning. Our, our friend Anita Arnold is here once again because it is about to be the Charlie Christian International Music Festival. Of course, Charlie Christian, the, uh, the great artist, uh, pioneer of the electric guitar from Deep Deuce, is uh, from here in Oklahoma City, and uh, always so proud that you, that you honor that legacy with the, the name of this festival. But uh, we want to learn a little bit more about it, so let me ask the clerk to uh, read this proclamation. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center, now in its 49th year, was organized to showcase the cultures of African Americans and has brought to our city and our state the best in fine arts and arts education experiences to help develop the artistic talents and teaching abilities of Oklahomans. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has produced the annual Charlie Christian International Music Festival in Oklahoma City for the education and enrichment of all people for 34 years. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center recognizes the contributions of many Oklahoma musicians to the field of music through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival to be held May 30th through June 2nd, 2019. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center will celebrate Charlie Christian's musical contributions to the world with jam sessions and musical tribute at the Supper Club reminiscent of the Benny Goodman era and an outdoor event reminiscent of the Deep Deuce Days during this year's festival. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has brought immeasurable recognition to Oklahoma City through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival and has established the festival as an international attraction for Oklahoma City as a sponsoring organization of the event and posthumous recipient on behalf of Charlie Christian of the Edturgan Jazz Hall of Fame Award given at Lincoln Center in New York City and the Oklahoma Hall of Fame Award. Now therefore, David Holt, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim May 30th through June 2nd as Charlie Christian International Music Festival Week in Oklahoma City and encourages all citizens to take this opportunity to experience the musical artistry of the festival and commend the Black Liberated Arts Center for their service to this community. Very good. Well, we, of course, as I said, are joined by Anita Arnold. And Anita, we'd love to hear a little bit more from you this morning about uh, Charlie Christian International Music Festival. Thank you, Mr. Bayer, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, 
let me just set the record straight since it's raining and we've had our weather. Uh, all of the activities that we have for the Charter Christian Festival this year will be indoors. I'll put it that way. We had planned an outdoor one, but when we saw that May was going to be full of rain, we changed that. Um, this year will be Black Incorporated's 50th year starting June 1st. We start in on our 50th anniversary here in Oklahoma City. And uh, we're going to have a number of celebration, collaborative celebrations throughout the year, all year long. Uh, we invite you to come to our festival, which starts at the Oklahoma History Center on May 30th with a jam session, May 31st over at the Bryant Center, 2200 North Bryant Street, and ends at the Montalano Event Center at 11200 Northeastern. <laughs> and it's going to be a great, great musical celebration. We thank you for supporting us over the years. We appreciate the city for everything that the city has done in, in, in this period of time. We are happy to still be here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, hang on one second. I know Councilwoman Nice wanted to say a few words. It's only befitting since everything's happening in Ward 7 uh, for us to say congratulations for your upcoming 50th year. Uh, for Black Liberated Arts um, Center, and for everything that is to come for this Charlie Christian Jazz Festival, uh, international festival that's going to take place uh, starting on May 30th. With that, I wish it well, and uh, we can't wait for it next weekend, and I move that, move that we approve this resolution. It's actually a proclamation, but let's just vote for fun. We All vote. in favor, of cast vote. your votes. Don't, don't vote, don't vote, don't vote, don't vote. I'm just so used to that. I'm it's all right. So used to that. It's kind of random, but this is I just know. a proclamation. But thank you. Your support is noted. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, again, thank you, Anita, for all you do for the cultural life of our city. You've been a great friend of the city for, for a long time. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for Anita Arnold and everybody who makes the festival happen. All right, that concludes uh, my presentations, and I will make my way back to my seat. All right, we also have, uh, under Office of the Mayor, we have items... 3, B, C, and D with some uh, appointments. We could take them as one motion. Got a motion? Second. And a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That concludes Office of the Mayor. Brings us to item four, Journal of Council Proceedings, where we have items A and B that we can take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then we have requests for uncontested continuances. We have two listed on the agenda and then maybe some more. Mr. City Manager. Yes, um, on page 26 under item five, I'm sorry, under item nine, J1D, 1537 South Irving Street. We're gonna strike this item. The owner is secured and we'll strike all these items that I'm going to list. Um, item K, 305 Northwest 26th Street. We'll strike this item due to the owner is secured. Uh, item M, 2445 Southwest 48th Street, the owner is secured. Item O, 901 Northwest 91st Street, the owner is secured. Item P, 1222 Northwest 92nd Street, the owner is secured. Then on page 27, under abandoned, abandoned buildings, item 9K1, item D, 1537 South Irving Street, the owner is secured. 2445 Southwest 48th Street, the owner has secured, and 1222 Northwest 92nd Street, the owner has secured. On page 28 also, under item 901 and 2, we're going to defer this item to June 4th. And that is all the items I have. In addition to the ones listed on the agenda? Correct. Okay, which is 9A8 and 9E. Yes.
Okay, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Now we've got revocable permits, item six. 6A is a revocable permit with family builders for Chalk the Walk uh, on June 8th. Um, do we have anyone to speak? All right, then Council Councilwoman Hammond. Yeah, I move to approve the item. Okay, motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. 6B, revocable right of way use permit with DNA Racing uh, to hold the Oklahoma City Pro-Am. Um, and we do have, uh, looks like, uh, We'll start with Chad Hodges. Great. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind coming to the center here and you can raise that microphone up. Um, I'm Chad Hodges. I'm with DNA Racing. Uh, this will be our eighth year to put on the Oklahoma City Pro-Am Classic. Uh, we'll uh, host the event Friday night in Midtown. Saturday we have a new venue in Capitol Hill and then Sunday in Film Row. Excellent. And we actually also have another person who's signed up to speak on this item. Um, so um, you might have a seat here in the front row sure. and uh, let's uh, have Joy Reardon. Hello. Um, the only concern I have with it is when they do Midtown, uh, as most people don't know, is uh, the towers. There's actually four buildings there, and it makes it difficult for the uh, EMS and fire to get to our building. <coughs> and also with the streetcar running, how is it going to affect that? I'm sure the answer on that one of uh, how it's going to affect right if we have the street cars still running during that time. What? Uh, we, Midtown, the Midtown course doesn't we don't doesn't cross the street, the street car, car. Not at all. Okay, well, there's that. The one that's, if I understand right, it runs up Broadway. Now that would be the Automobile Alley course, which isn't happening this year. So that's was my concern was uh, the fact that it. In years past, it, they have actually isolated our building with Automobile Alley um, uh, race. Okay. That okay. was my concern. All right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Hammond, Councilman Stone. I second it. <laughs> All right. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a great event. All right, 6C, revocable right-of-way use permit with Freedom Oklahoma to hold the Equality Run on June 9th. Um, we've got someone here to speak. Yeah, hi, Allie. apologies. I think I forgot to sign up. Ali Shin with Freedom <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the Equality Run, but essentially this is just an opportunity to promote some health and wellness in a community that's disproportionately affected by drug abuse and alcohol abuse and other health issues. Okay. Councilwoman Hammond. I don't know if I have any questions, but I'm glad it's happening in Ward 6, so I move to approve the item. I'd like to second it. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank Thanks, Allie. Have a great event. 6D, revocable right-of-way use permit with MTM recognition to hold the run for recognition on June 14th. Um, and we do have uh, Mike Ketcher's side. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is our eighth annual race. Uh, it's hosted by MTM Recognition and also OK Runner. Um, all the proceeds go to support Special Olympics Oklahoma. Great. Um, Councilwoman Hammond? <laughs> Got a busy... I hear so many events are happening <laughs> for six in the next few weeks. I move to approve the item. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Mike. I hope everyone could come out and run, get support, <laughs> supported, please. Thank you. All right, thank you. Item 6E, revocable right-of-way use permit with Oklahoma Lawyers for Children to hold the Masquerade 5K uh, on June 8th. Do we have anyone to speak? Oh, come forward and uh, say your name and address. Good morning. Uh, Brett Hale, 2412 Brookside Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm with Adventure Tech Sports representing Oklahoma Lawyers for Children's annual Masquerade 5K 
which will take place on June 8th. It's the fourth year we've done this event. It benefits uh, the efforts of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children uh, to defend the county's abused and neglected children. Also celebrates families' reunification through the juvenile justice system. Uh, we appreciate the Oklahoma City's continued support in this cause and would like to invite all of you out on June 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cooper. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have Thank a you. Great event. All right, we're now going to recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, uh, where we have items A through F that we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A through E we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we'll adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we have items A through C we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, reconvene as the council, uh, where we now find ourselves on page five of your printed agenda and the consent docket. And uh, I know we have a presentation on item two presentations, AU and AV. Is there anything else that anybody else would uh, like to pull out or discuss? Uh, I'd like to pull out AI uh, number one. Okay. AK. AK. Okay. Mayor, I'd like to pull out T two and three. T. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, item A AI three. Okay. Anybody else? Um, oh. AD two, two, three, four, six. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Uh, we'll take them in order, which I believe means we will start at T two and three. Councilwoman Nice. Um, I just wanted to pull this out because we are excited about what's to come with our Strong Neighborhood Initiative for our out-of-school uh, programs for the summer. And if you could, just kind of, I'm going to have Ms. Shannon Entz just come and explain uh, what's to come for this summer for both of these schools with uh, Martin Luther King Elementary as well as Thelma Parks Elementary. Thank you. I'm glad to talk about this. I'm Shannon Entz. I'm a city planner with the City of Oklahoma City. And uh, we manage the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative in our office, and we have the after-school programs. They're actually summer programs that you are approving today with con for the contracts with the Boys and Girls Club uh, the, that will operate actually in Capitol Hill, not in Ward 7, um, but in Mr. Stone's Ward. And then we'll have the two programs in Northeast Oklahoma City, um, one that will serve MLK and one that will serve Thelma Parks. And they will have all kinds of programming uh, based on uh, you, you probably see in the, in the item here, there are a list of priorities that we set, and all of these entities, Boys and Girls Club, the Oklahoma After School Network, and Urban League all responded to this very positively. We had a selection committee that helped determine who we were going to contract with, and they, they were all, it was a unanimous decision on who we wanted to contract with. But they're going to do things like STEM programming, recreation, they're going to have life skills training, they're going to talk about how to build self-esteem and self-confidence. So there's all kinds of things that are going to be offered for the summer programs for just four weeks um, in the uh, SNI areas. And we're excited about, again, uh, what's to come for these young people this summer. So thank you yeah. for explaining that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll stay with you, Councilwoman Nice. Uh, items A, D, 2, 3, 4, and 6. Well. Obviously, um, we get excited when we get street resurfacing. So I just want to make sure we mention these uh, few streets that we have from Douglas Boulevard to Post on Northeast uh, 122nd, 
Uh, also that same 122nd from Air Depot to uh, North Midwest Boulevard, uh, as well as North Sooner Road, East Hefner Road to East Britain Road. And uh, it looks like we also have Northeast 178th Street and that's happening North Indian Meridian Road to North Triple X Road. So we are excited about uh, the upcoming resurfacing for those areas in Ward 7. So um, that's really we just want, I wanted to make sure we mention those streets. Right. Thank you. Uh, AI1, Councilwoman Hammond. Yeah, I just wanted to um, point this uh, item out a few weeks ago. Looks like early May we got, I know Councilman Cooper, McAtee, and myself got an email about this marker. Um, and as much as I'd like to take credit for it getting fixed so quickly, um, I just wanted to point out how quickly the staff um, jumped on getting this marker fixed because the um, resident who reached out was really concerned about it just being an eyesore and um, in the neighborhood. And um, so I just, again, want to commend the staff for being so um, responsive to getting that fixed. Okay, and uh, item uh, AI3, Councilman Cooper. So I just wanted to uh, point out that on May Avenue between uh, Northwest 38th Street and Northwest 40th Street is gonna receive um, some work done when it comes to the uh, integrity of that street. Um, so we're gonna see uh, some additional uh, sidewalks, we're going to see some resurfacing done there uh, to strengthen that bridge as you cross over May Avenue, and I think that's pretty important. So I just wanted to make sure that residents were aware of it as they start seeing that construction work again. Great. And uh, item AK, Councilman Greiner. Yeah, this is a resurfacing of a uh, Wilshire between Richland and Cemetery Road. So it's about two miles. It's an agreement between the city of Yukon and Canadian County. Uh, we are allocating 700000 and so is Yukon. And then Canadian County is doing the labor uh, materials and equipment. And so uh, I just want to thank the, uh, all the staff members who worked on this. I imagine it's quite a few public works members, uh, probably some, somebody from legal, possibly somebody from planning. But I know that it, Wilshire is a shared road between the city of Yukon and Oklahoma City. And it, on shared roads, there's always a challenge to get them repaved. And Wilshire is one of those out in Canadian County that has uh, been on my priority list ever since I got elected six years ago. Um, so it's, it's been something that has uh, uh, continually been on um, my mind. And I'm glad that we are finally able to get an agreement between those three entities uh, to, to get this done and I would like to say that that's going to be the end of it but uh, everything east of this uh, all the way to the turnpike also needs to get done too so I'm hoping that this can be a little bit of a snowball and that we can uh, continue to work with Canadian County and the city of Yukon um, on, uh, on this road so thank you. All right, thank you. And that brings us to the presentations uh, at AU and AV. So on AU, Doug Daller uh, is here, and he's going, our budget director, he is going to make a presentation on a, a budget uh, amendment that's being introduced today. Good morning, Mayor and Council. It's a little bit confusing as we're considering the FY20 budget uh, during uh, in-between weeks, but we have an amendment to the FY19 budget that's before you. We've got three changes uh, that we're proposing. The first is in hotel motel tax. Uh, we're required by the revenue bonds that support the projects at the fairgrounds to transfer all the revenue we receive for uh, the CVB portion and the fairgrounds portion to the PPA as part of our debt service requirements. It comes back whatever they don't need. Well, this year we're a little ahead of target on, on our revenue, and so we need a budget amendment so that we have the budget authority to be able to send all that revenue over in case these next couple of months come in a little over target. Um, and so that's just kind of more of a formality there. The second piece, though, with hotel motel tax, is to give authority in the 111th portion of the hotel motel tax that supports event sponsorship activity. The Con Convention and Visitors Bureau is considering uh, paying uh, the NCAA for the obligations from all sports association associated with the Women's College World Series. There's some amounts due there, about $306,000. If they decide that they want to use that event sponsorship money for that, we would need the budget authority to transfer fund balance uh, to them uh, to pay that bill. So that's, again, something that's uh, being done prospectively in case that's needed. 
Uh, there wouldn't be time to do that if we wait a, a few more weeks, so that's why we've added that on here. The last change is in the special purpose fund. This is where we take donations or other things that are dedicated for a specific purpose. We're increasing that by $100,000 uh, for the planning department for budget authority for the homelessness study that's being uh, conducted. This was a donation from the Inasmuch Foundation to pay for a homelessness study. And so this would give them budget authority to spend that uh, on the contract. And they're working through the RFP now for that process. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have it. The total increase is $856,000 to our budget. That's a, uh, about one half of 1%, uh, actually 0.05% of our budget. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. So the next item is item AV, and Doug will also speak to this. This is the memorandum of understanding with OG&E on the um, LED light program, changing out LED lights on our uh, street lights. Right. Yeah, the reason for this MOU is, is, again, we are making this transition from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. Uh, OG&E maintains the vast majority of our street lights. We have 34,000 street lights. 8,000 of those are owned by the city. Those were installed either by ODOT and then conveyed to us along the highways, or they may be on traffic signals uh, on our uh, own signals that were installed as part of a, a uh, intersection improvements. Uh, under the franchise agreement uh, that we have with OG&E, they provide us 3% of revenues uh, and one half of 1% of the kilowatt hours used uh, in the city that we can use as credit uh, for our uh, city facilities. And so uh, under the franchise agreement, we use the, some of that free uh, credit or free service uh, for our street lights, and that covers the maintenance as well. But with the new rate structure with LED lights, uh, that's going to be changing, and so we will need to be paying the infrastructure costs related to uh, LED lights, the pole and the fixture. And this MOU spells out that transition uh, and how that will occur as poles are replaced, as fixtures are replaced, they will begin to be charged to us. Uh, and eventually, we expect that to be about a 3.3 to $3.9 million cost, but it's going to take several decades for us to get to that point where all of those have been replaced. We also expect some significant energy savings from the transition to LEDs, uh, and that savings is incorporated into that cost. But the other significant piece of this MOU is what necessitated this OG&E, as they change over LED lights on those poles that are city, on those fixtures that are city owned, they're going to take ownership of the fixture. Because the cost for LEDs is much more significant, they're going to own those fixtures, but they'll be on our pole, and so they wanted to I uh, have an MOU to make sure of that, kind of clarify that ownership status. They'll own the fixtures, we'll own the poles, they'll still do the maintenance and they'll charge us a, 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 a for that maintenance cost there. So um, the other piece that's on here is just to reiterate OG&E's standard that uh, when a light is burned out, uh, if it's a standard uh, replacement within 10 days, their, their plan is to have that replaced within 10 days. If it's uh, something else like wiring or something more significant, it can take longer but just wanted to make sure that that expectation of 10 days when the street light goes out is the expectation for repair there. This allows us to move forward with the LED light replacement. We have a lot of situations where there's one-off lights that are out that are incandescent lights and they don't have the replacement parts to replace that. When they go in and replace a fixture though, it's not, it's not just changing out a light. They're actually changing out a fixture and it'll be multiple fixtures, I mean multiple lights that are affected at one time. Um, and there's some work that has to be so done, so sometimes you might see a string of lights that goes dark while they're doing the conversion. So it'll be some of that as we go along, but it'll be about a five-year period that that, that, that is OG&E's yes. expectation, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. All right. That is all the items on the consent docket. Uh, we can Mayor, take if I could. Yeah. Can please. we vote on uh, seven? Hold on, I just lost it. 7S1 separately, please. 7S1. That's the uh, Booyah. Is this, is this Booyah? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank you. All right. Well, I stand ready for any motions anybody wants to make. Like to move all the items, save that one, Mark? Move all the items except for 7S1. Okay. Got a second? All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is to move all the items on the consent docket except for 7S1. Seeing no discussion, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. So um, on 7S1, I would like to make a motion. Okay. Um, I would like to make a motion that we defer that 
for two weeks. Okay. Um, I just, I think I would like to understand kind of where it's going at on the trail and um, how it's going to look from the drive around Draper. So. Okay. So we've got a, a motion for a deferral of that item for two weeks and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the concurrence docket. Uh, on page 20 of your printed agenda, we've got items A through P we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Brings us to items requiring separate votes. Uh, item nine, items under item nine. We'll start with A. These are ordinances on final hearing. These were recommended for approval at the Planning Commission. And we've got A1, 1446 North Rockwell Avenue, going from O2 to R4. Uh, Councilman McAtee. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the applicant present? Uh, we have a George, maybe, who signed up. Are you the applicant? Yeah, I'm the applicant. Okay, yeah. I Okay, would you explain uh, what, what it is you're trying to do here with this rezoning? Could, could you state, just explain what you're trying to do uh, here? Um, and, and start with your name the, and address. The boundaries, uh, the uh, northeast, uh, northwest, east side boundary is also an apartment connecting to this property and surrounding there is also multiple family. So I thought I can change it to office to uh, multiple family. Okay. And what was your name and address? George Raju. Uh -huh. And your address? 11860 South. That's my permanent address. Okay. Uh, Southwest First Street, Yukon, Oklahoma, 73099. Thank you. How many units are going to be in this particular development? Say one more time. How many units in the... I haven't get the plan yet. Um, I was uh, asking one engineer to draw a plan, but I haven't decided anything how many units can fit in it. So once I got the approval uh, for sound changing, thought I can uh, ask the engineer to draw the plan. Can I have somebody from planning come out and uh, explain the process that uh, this particular project will go through? Bob, Bob's here. He'll, he'll be required to get a building permit, and the number of units will be determined by the amount, the size of the building, the amount of parking that he provides. And so How about other things like uh, any, any fencing required or uh, what plans there are for security on the premises and things like that? When will they be addressed, Bob? Well, this property being zoned R4 wouldn't, it's surrounded by commercial and office zoning, so the site proof screening wouldn't be required. Uh, the security, uh, that's something that the manage, management of the building would determine, and typically they work with the police department. They have a program uh, to work on uh, multifamily units and provide security. The police then pro but work with the management to make sure they provide adequate security. So that the council understands this particular property is sitting among some other properties that are not zoned for R4. Uh, there was an R4 zoning up uh, just to the north of this that uh, had some challenges over the years. And what steps are we taking to see that this particular complex does not replicate those challenges? Well, I, really, there, there, there is a program in the planning department that, that they deal with uh, multifamilies. I'm not familiar with the, de the details. I know they work with uh, lighting. Uh, that's landscaping to make sure all the areas are open so so it's easy for people to see if there's activities going on that aren't appropriate uh, and at some point when they get closer to occupancy we'll work with them to, to address those issues okay uh, thank you sir for your comments unless there are any questions this was not uh, there were no objection the Planning Commission for this was unanimously approved Unless the council has any question, I move for approval. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, now we're at 9A2 at 13700 Southeast 31st Street, going from AA to RA2. Uh, Councilman Stone. Thank you, Mayor. Has anyone signed up to speak? Just the applicant. Okay. Um, it was approved unanimously at the Planning Commission. It's a simple single lot split, so with that, I would move for approval. Okay. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9A3 at 2519 Southwest 59th from R4 to C3, Councilwoman Hammond. Has anyone signed up to speak? No, ma'am. Okay, I, yeah, I see that the Planning Commission um, approved it unanimously, so I move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9A4, 3201 Northwest 150th uh, Street from R4 to O2. Councilman uh, Stonecipher. Thank you, Your Honor. This is an ordinance on final hearing. It was approved by the Planning Commission on March 28, uh, 2019, and staff recommends its approval, so I move for approval. Okay, we've got a motion. Anyone care to make second. a second? Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9A5 uh, at 1432 Northeast 12th, going from R1 to R2, Councilwoman Nice. And the, the applicant is available for questions. The applicant is? Mm -hmm. David well, Campbell. Actually, this is an ordinance on final hearing as well, and I have no protests on this, so I'll move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9A6 at 3826 Newcastle Road from R1 to I2, Councilman McAtee. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the applicant present? This is an unusual zoning going <coughs> from uh, a request going from uh, R1 to I2. Tim, if you would give the council a brief overview of what you we're bet. trying to Tim Johnson here. with Johnson Associates here on behalf of the applicant. It is a unique condition. This is a existing non-conforming use. It's being, it has been used as a warehouse yard as far back as aerial records allows us to look. Uh, and in that time frame, we noticed that there's been these residential units around this that have existed during that same time frame. So we didn't have any protesters uh, at the meeting. Uh, it's just the, a lot of lot splits had been done. These are platted lots to create this uh, area that's outlined in the dash, and there's an existing warehouse building and a storage yard there. The new owner wants to bring it into conformance. Uh, he's a geothermal uh, mechanical contractor, and they run a tight ship and an ice operation, and so what you'll see stored back there is some PVC pipes they use for their geothermal, and everything else will be inside. So this is kind of trying to bring the Official zoning up to date with what's being used out there. Yes, into conformance. Um, unless the council, and we, do we have anybody sign up? Uh, with no objection and nobody to sign up, uh, knowing the purpose of this, I move for approval. All right, I've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Um, that was six, right? All right, 9A7. 13100 Northwestern Avenue from PUD 1544 to PUD 1714. Uh, and we uh, also, I know we have a presentation here yes. from Ian Colgan. Councilwoman Nice, do you want to start there? Uh, we can start with the presentation. Yeah, Ian Colgan is here from the Oklahoma Housing Authority. Yeah, uh, actually, this is not for that. Oh, it, oh, that's my fault. Okay. I will Brian concur Coon with the city manager that the that is his fault. <laughs> Brian Coon is the <laughs> developer for this project. I've been caught off guard here before, but that really did. <laughs> Brian Coon with Hewitt Zollers representing the applicant. Uh, this is the property that is immediately south of Costco. Um, the office building, the medical building was built several years ago. Things have changed in that area since we've got, when, since we moved in or built that building. So what we're all trying to accomplish here is create two tracks and add a couple uses. Um, convalescent care to the east of us is a behavioral hospital, and we've had some comments that it would be nice if there was another facility that could, people could live in for short periods. So uh, to add restaurants possibly and the convalescent care. So um, anyway, and each tract would have a sign. Right now we have one sign for the total property. 
So this would create two signs for two tracks. Uh, while I am for it, I know there's definitely going to be a traffic concern um, for just this area, um, as we, we know already, uh, with the opening of the Costco and, and what's going on in, in Councilman uh, Stonecipher's ward. Um, I'm going to go ahead and approve this and move for approval. And uh, we'll work on the back end as far as traffic to see what we can get done. And hopefully you'll work with us as well to make yes, sure, sure we can take Absolutely. care of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Second. <clears throat> Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 9A8 uh, was deferred to June 4th, which brings us to 9A9 at 927 East Reno. Going from I-1 to SPUD 1107, um, this was deferred from May 7th. Uh, Councilwoman Nice? Yes, is the applicant here for this? No. Okay. Um, I have a concern about where this is actually going to be located and what is already happening in this area. And uh, this is going from... Um, the light industrial to the spud and what's happening already when we look at that light industrial area is uh, the recycling plants and, and everything that's not too far from there and then we have a neighborhood that's already concerned about some noises and different things that are happening and I have a concern when we're trying to put uh, an assisted living center and some seniors in the area of, of industrial. Um, with those loud concerns, and there was a an article that was in in uh, one of the local publications just this last week, and you can pick it up today is the last day to read about these concerns uh, that these neighbors have been having, and they are literally uh, within a mile to two miles of where this industrial area already is, and they have felt, um, and I have seen, and I have also heard what these uh, neighbors have seen and heard. So just for me to hear it and see it a couple of times to them numerous times, uh, that's where my concern comes into play. So I wanna see um, again how we can probably defer this or um, I'm almost wanting to send it back to planning commission uh, to, to figure out if there's another option for this. But I'm not quite sure what to do with that. So I'm gonna defer it, move for a deferral. Second. To, uh, uh, let's move it to the, let's move it to actually, uh, yeah, two weeks is fine. Okay. All right. So motion to defer item 9A9 for two weeks. And you had a second, right? Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Deferral passes unanimously. Okay. We're at uh, 9B1 and 2. These items are related. Uh, one is an amendment to the master design statement. Uh, to include language uses in track two are subject to any moratorium approved by the City Council. And 9B2 is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 2125 Northeast 28th Street from R1 and R2 to PUD 1713. Uh, Councilwoman Nice. I think this is actually going to be our yes. presentation with yes. Ian Colgan. Ah, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Ian Colgan with the Oklahoma City Housing Authority. I was pretty sure that map was not my project, <laughs> but I was sitting pretty far back, so it's good that we clarified. Uh, I'm going to do a brief overview of our project here for uh, final approval for planned unit development. Uh, it's an area that we call the Northeast Duplexes. A little bit of background on this project. Uh, the Oklahoma City Housing Authority is a public body corporate with a board of commissioners appointed by the mayor. At any given time, we own and operate about 3,000 public housing units across the city and administer over 4,000 housing choice vouchers. So about 7,000 plus households that we provide housing for on any given day. Uh, over the years, uh, Congress has seen fit to defund 
public housing uh, overall over the country. And uh, Oklahoma City Housing Authority, along with other housing authorities, have suffered from this in terms of managing and operating our properties. So a couple years ago, we passed a strategic development plan that called for the renovation or redevelopment of a significant chunk of our portfolio, about 1,000 units, uh, to uh, recapitalize them into the next generation. And this project is one of those projects that we prioritized. Uh, I can back, zoom out a little bit. So the Northeast duplexes uh, consist of 159 public housing units between 26th and 29th Street on the east side of MLK Avenue. Uh, they actually predate the Housing Authority. They were built in the 40s and conveyed to the Housing Authority after 1965 when we were incorporated. Uh, we, we determined that these units uh, had a higher and better use for this property as well as were functionally obsolete. Uh, we did a study that found that it would cost just as much to renovate these units as it would to completely replace the units. So that seemed like an ideal opportunity to look for something bigger and better to do with this property. Uh, the 159 units sit on about 14 acres. A couple years ago, we actually acquired an additional 15 acres to the east on Creston, uh, 28th Street in Creston. Uh, that gave us 30 acres with which to rebuild the duplexes into what we consider a, a brand new neighborhood rather than just a brand new property. Uh, so let me walk you through, uh, this is a conceptual plan of the entire project. I'm gonna walk you through some of the uh, key land uses. You zoom out a bit. So first is uh, mixed-use frontage. So right on MLK, we're taking advantage of the arterial and our limited frontage to do vertically mixed-use uh, development with some apartments over commercial, about 10,000 square feet of commercial, uh, which is targeted for uh, either small businesses or various services use. Next. We intend to rebuild a neighborhood that is multi-generational. So we're going to put uh, an affordable assisted living facility on the site as well as some independent living so that we can create needed uh, affordable housing for seniors. Next. The project has two core neighborhoods, east and west, that will take the 159 units and replace those units, but also add an array of housing that uh, is anywhere from uh, Section 8 uh, income qualification all the way to market rate. Uh, so we really want to create a mixed income, diversified neighborhood that is not only multi-generational but uh, mul multiple incomes um, that would then take advantage of both the commercial and next what we call the neighborhood hub, which is the centerpiece of the neighborhood. Uh, it is the community center. It, it will offer a family services center that uh, will offer a number of family educational and health resources, not only to the residents, but also the neighborhood at large. And then the last phase to come a little later is a home ownership incubator, which uh, will, will set aside lots for new construction of uh, housing units that will be offered to people who go through programs to achieve financial stability uh, and then uh, to, to, a, to a more financially stable first home ownership product that can then also take advantage of the services and amenities of the overall project. And with that, uh, answer any questions you may have. Thanks for the presentation. Would you mind, um, and this is something I've heard people discuss, but I wouldn't, you're an expert on this. Would you mind discussing with us the importance of that kind of integration of the uh, varying levels of income and, and instead of segregating off public housing, but having people of varying incomes living on the same street? Like, why is that important? Where are we learning that's important? That'd be my first question. So I think there's, there's a lot of reasons why that's important. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about two particular ones. Uh, first, neighborhoods in general are mixed income and, and, they, and they work successfully in a lot of different ways. We found that, and not only we, but uh, the myriad research on public housing in general has found that the over-concentration of people uh, with government assistance in public housing or Section 8 tends to create problems. And that's not necessarily due to the, the people living there. It's the structure of the units. It's location of the units, whether they're located in the right places with best access. And so this has caused uh, multiple issues in terms and, and 
related to NIMBYism all across the country, whether it's public housing or, or Section 8, that uh, isn't necessarily uh, uh, well-founded, but uh, nevertheless, it, it does cause uh, uh, inordinate concentration of units where otherwise it sh shouldn't necessarily be placed there. So by layering in other income levels, we not only create a neighborhood that is desirable for other people at higher income levels, therefore bringing up the quality of housing for the people receiving the assistance and looking for um, aspirational uh, development in their own lives, um, but we create a level of stability and security for the overall neighborhood that benefits those, those households as well. Oh, and then secondly, I was really encouraged to see trees as part of the presentation of one of my friends who's a former representative in the State House sent me some data just earlier today saying that, uh, I'm just going to quote here, trees appropriately placed to shade homes can reduce summer cooling costs by 50%. So I was really excited to see that all along these projects here uh, that you're, you're putting in place. Um, and then, um, and by projects I mean like the project you're working on, I do not mean housing projects. Um, and then also uh, said that at a micro level, temperatures under the shade of a mature tree will be nine degrees cooler than the temperature under the shade of a man-made structure. So this excites me quite a bit. And I think uh, when the construction is complete, you're going to have people over there feeling a little bit better in July and August. We find shade and landscaping to be crucial. Uh, the, the eastern part, eastern neighborhood, is an undeveloped tract, which gives us an opportunity not only to enhance it, but to keep as, as many trees as, as are possible to create a more naturalized landscape, which we're excited about, especially in terms of stormwater management. And then uh, yeah. our first redevelopment project, SUNY Haven Apartments on 36th Street, if you drive by that, we've already installed some landscape frontage as well as some more in the back, and you can kind of see our dedication. This is, this is a neighborhood to, you know, um, take pride in, uh, not only for its residents, but within the city of Oklahoma City. So we plan on investing quite a bit in that type of um, uh, site design. Speaking of construction, what's the timeline to complete this project? So we hope to apply for financing in the fall uh, and close in about a year, and uh, anticipate it would take about two years to build uh, in various phases. Question, if I could. Uh, in my ward, SEPTED has been uh, a popular topic of discussion for multifamily housing and using the environmental uh, aspects of it to control crime and other activities like that. How do you balance that with this desire for, uh, for trees uh, throughout the property? Well, so obviously the, the, there's certain components to landscaping and trees that um, you know, have to be balanced with visibility. Uh, and that's an important component of, of the security for the site. The site itself has actually been designed very specifically with SEPTED and other public housing security aspects in mind. Mind you, when it's all said and done, it will no longer be public housing, it'll be mixed income. Um, but one of the things we did was uh, actually break up the, the property with a north-south spine that would be uh, also a fire lane and create individualized blocks. Those blocks could then be secured uh, with their access, both automobile and pedestrian-wise, so that the only people who can be behind the units are the people who live there. And that clear, very clearly, using SEPTED and other uh, design, uh, delineates the public and the private space. So then we can control for the pri private space in one way, but we can also control for the public space. And th this property right now, I think if you go to the second slide, you can see that it's, it's all entirely open right now. Anyone can just walk around. Uh, it's not a very secure location. But by redesigning it with an urban, urban fabric kind of feel, uh, you, the public activities on the street, where you can focus street lighting, uh, uh, cameras, other security access in terms of our security, as well as police. And then you can, uh, in terms of the units and the rear of the units, that is secure for the residents living there. Uh, we, we take security very seriously, and uh, that is one of the most integral, probably top three components of the entire design of the, the neighborhood would be, the, would be those philosophies. Um, I just want to uh, kind of uh, to echo what you, what Councilman Cooper asked you about, and I think what, um, you know, what we, when we think about mixed income neighborhoods and the importance of having housing affordability, 
Um, I, uh, just this week, um, I received an information on the National Low Income Housing Coalition's uh, fact sheet for Oklahoma. And um, for, I believe this was research, or this is updated as of this month um, in 2019, um, that 100,000, no, yeah, 103,619 renter households in Oklahoma pay more than half of their monthly income on rent. So if you think about if you, uh, let's say, you know, you have a thousand dollar, just make an easy number, um, paycheck, people are spending over $500 of that on rent, leaving, you know, four to $500 on all of the other expenses of transportation, uh, utilities, grocery bills, um, if they have children, um, costs for, uh, related to their kids, and then Additionally, in order to afford a modest one-bedroom apartment, a minimum wage worker in Oklahoma has to work 66 hours per week. So the house, our housing affordability issue in Oklahoma is not, um, you know, I always hear we're not in LA, we're not a um, San Francisco, we're not Austin. But I want to encourage us to remember that we're typically about 15 to 20 years behind them, but these statistics show that we are getting there. Um, and so seeing projects like this, I hope it encourages private development to recognize the um, importance of this and how it is a boon for our whole community um, because uh, the housing um, low income tax credit for housing uh, supported 3.6 billion in wages and business income generated in Oklahoma. Um, as well as uh, 1.4 billion in tax revenue generated. So it's not um, just a drain on society as I think we typically have talked about, but is really a boon to um, not just our vulnerable neighbors, but to everyone. It's a benefit to everyone when we have developments like this. So I just wanted to throw some numbers out there. And I just want to add that with that, this also brings up morale for the community. Um, when you said 1940s, my jaw dropped. I didn't realize that these homes had been there since the 1940s and people have been living in these conditions since the 1940s in this community uh, with a food desert in the area in question. Uh, so when we're looking at this and we're looking at the possibilities of what, what is to come and um, with trees or no trees but just a new neighborhood and I, I believe that when we have new neighborhoods, you have new communities uh, with the same mindset, but they also want to protect uh, that investment of their community. So that, that's what we're looking forward to when it comes to this. Also, the, the whole conversation of home ownership, uh, because that means the community is vested in the community. They're vested in this uh, development and they're vested in Oklahoma City and that's what we want at the end of the day and also the fact of the community centers and just the hub of those services that have been lacking uh, for this particular area of, of Oklahoma City and Northeast Oklahoma City so um, I know a lot of us are very excited and we've had a couple of community meetings to, for this to be explained to the community as well so uh, this has not just been introduced through planning, this has gone through the community as well, and we'll continue to have those conversations. So with that, I move for approval. Did we have? Sorry. I think Tim Johnson just has one. <laughs> thing. I was excited. <laughs> I was excited today. We want to keep that momentum, but there is a little bit of housekeeping. Um, again, Tim Johnson uh, with Johnson Associates. We, uh, there was some confusion at the Planning Commission uh, at the motion. And so we are requesting to be clear that we add back in the use unit of 8300.35, which is eating establishments, fast food, further defined as fast casual dining, which would include a Zoe's Kitchen, a Chipotle, or a Panera. So a walk up, and that's in that restricted to that commercial tract uh, up against uh, M.O. King. And I appreciate that, um, that uh, retraction in addition for that, because that's actually what is also needed. Uh, within the community, just that, that sense of being able to be in the community and, and stay. Thank you. So with that, I move for approval. And I'm going to take actually, your... Actually, no, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take your motion as, uh, as B1. That Amendment is B1. to the master design I move step. to okay. approve B1. All right. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes. Uh, Councilman Stone Cipher is not lit up. There we go. All right. 
Passes unanimously. Now I move for approval of B2. Okay. 9B2. All right, got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. 9C, ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval, closing a utility easement at 14901 Lauren Lane. Councilman Stone Cipher. Your Honor, I have to recuse myself on this one. Oh, okay. All right, we'll wait, a, we'll pause a moment while you uh, leave the room. Okay, we're still on item uh, 9C. Anyone make, want to make a motion? Um, I don't see any protests, so I will move yeah. for approval. Yeah, Blaine Nice, 100 North Broadway for the applicant we'd ask. Okay. For approval. And with that, I'll move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously with Councilman Stone Cipher not in the room. 9D, ordinances on final hearing that were recommended for approval. Uh, we're at 91, a special permit to operate an emergency shelter and feeding site use in the I-2 moderate industrial district at 532 North Villa. Councilwoman Hammond. Yeah, do we have, I know it looks like we have the applicants here. Do we have anyone signed up to speak on this? No. no? Do you all want to share anything? You're good sitting, hanging out? Okay. <laughs> well, um, yes, I, I see there were, um, there were no uh, protests or uh, no votes at commit planning commission, so I move for approval. And I assume this is related to the uh, uh, low barrier night shelter project mm -hmm. from City Care. So exactly. thank you. That's exciting. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Uh, Councilman Stone Cipher, we've still got you. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Passes unanimously. All right, 9D2, special permit to operate a drinking establishment use in the C3 Community Commercial District at 5617 South Penn. Uh, and Councilwoman Hammond, we have a uh, person who had, the applicant is here. Yes. And, uh, sir, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address. My name is uh, Thomas Morrow and the uh, Establishment is at 5617 South Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, no, I want one for each one. And um, it was unanimously recommended by the Planning Commission for approval. It has been inspected by the Fire Department, Captain uh, uh, Eddie of the Oklahoma City Fire Department, um, the Health Department, uh, Agent uh, McKenzie Roberts, and the ABLE Commission. Uh, for Lieutenant uh, Karen Lipton. So all of those things have been um, uh, approved. So there's the issue of the special permit, but I have a problem. And the problem is that the uh, um, plan checker for the um, planning department uh, says that the number of square feet that I have is sufficient for 127 people. Based on 127 people, I have to have more than one exit and a second ADA compliant restroom, a fire suppression system, sprinkler system, um, more parking, and a licensed architect to uh, coordinate it all. What I'd like you to do is to limit my occupancy to 40, which would make almost all of those issues go away. because I don't plan to have 127 people there. I plan to have a maximum of 40. I have seating for 38, that gives me two staff members. Bob, can you speak to this? I, I just heard about this right before the meeting. Uh, currently, the, the, si the special permit that he's proposing, as he said, would allow 127. The, uh, Occupancy load is determined by through the plan checker based on square footage and the type of use. He has several issues there that really should be addressed through the plan review process. Uh, without a, an amended site plan that, that would limit it to 40 people, I mean, we really don't, I asked him if he'd defer, but he didn't want to. Uh, I mean, really, I, I don't have enough information right now to figure out the best way to approach this. Mm. Uh, but I've been working with the uh, planning department since November mm -hmm. and made absolutely no progress because he's basing it upon one factor, 
2,200 square feet. And he says, based on 2,200 square feet, which is about the size of a moderate home, I can pack 127 people in there. I don't plan to pack 127 people in there. My intended use is to have 40, maximum. I think with the wave of a pen today, you could say my occupancy is 40, all the other issues go away, with the possible exception of the second restroom, and I'm happy. He's not going to budge because his standards, according to city code, 2,200 square feet allows for 127 people. These, so, re these requirements are all based on public safety, the number of people in there. Um, if you approved it at this, with this amount, we can, if, if he can't provide those requirements, we can, through the building permit process, reduce the allowable square footage. But he really needs to do that at the permit stage. It's a Board of Appeals issue as opposed to the council's issue on it. It's a building code issue as, as opposed to this zoning issue. So can I ask, if we did defer it today, could that get, is that something that could, needs to happen? Would that want, we would we want that to happen before we approved the zoning change? Or is that something that can get tweaked if we- I don't need a zoning change. I'm zoned C3. Hmm. He, I'm zoned. He means the permit. He needs a special permit for yeah. that. I need okay, a special, special permit. permit. That's, that's kind of, you know, the planning commission recommends it. There's, uh, the staff has recommended it. Yeah. Um, but I can't use it. If yes, we could sit down with him okay. in two oh, weeks and, and try to work all this out. Okay. But I've been trying to work this out since November, and it's not working. So my recommendation. Blair, are you talking about the need to go to the Board of Adjustment for some type of clearance for this or something else? No, it's, it's a Board of Appeals issue. When you get to a certain level, you have to add bathrooms. You have to add... Uh, sprinkler systems those are the types of things that he doesn't want to do at the size that he's asking to be permitted so what he wants is a limitation on the 40 but we have to be able to control it through the permit or you know if we just if it's a zoning issue that's one thing but what his requirements are all building code which mm -hmm. if there is an appeal that would go to the building code uh, commission thank you it's really about occupancy. For 127 people, you would need all of these improvements in the building. For 40, you would not. Right. So if we move this forward, the special permit forward today, could we do all of that on the back end, or do we need to do all of the st things you're speaking about before we approve the special permit? We can, we can do it either way, because okay. he's not going to get a permit if we can't figure out how to limit him to 40 uh, 40 person occupancy if he doesn't want to do the sprinklers and he doesn't want to do the additional restrooms and the exits because that's all that's all fire building code that is public safety so the the fire department told me I did not need a second exit told me I did not need a fire um, sprinkler system the health department told me a unisex one bathroom was fine it is the um, city code not the state not the fire department not really safety, it's the plan checker who is saying, these are the criteria and I'm going to apply them based upon 127 occupants. So Bob, if we approve it today as it is, the requirements would be there, but that could be addressed through the permitting process? He could modify his permit to allow, an, we'd have to reduce process. the, the uh, square footage of his, his uh, the business to get to that 40 that he wants. In order to get to, but we can do that. So that's so, one way you could go. The other yeah, way you could go is meet with him over the next two weeks and come up with a new special right. permit. Yeah, I, I, I can do it. We'll do it either way, whatever the council's it comfortable with. It sounds like with. what would be easier would be, and I know it's probably a horrible headache to think to defer it for two weeks, but to make sure that you're not having to reduce your square footage. And if we can keep my office in the loop just to make sure that it's moving along, and I think I'd be more comfortable deferring it for two weeks, just to make sure that we're not putting you through a difficult process post-approval of the permit. Um, well, I know if you gave me a special permit right now to serve mixed drinks, I couldn't use it because I still can't open my right. door. Yeah. And I have been waiting since November. Yeah. 
and there has been no progress with the city, and it's all based on occupancy. Yeah. I have a security camera system in there that anyone from the city planning department could access. Five different, four, actually it's four different cameras. They could see what's going on in that facility 24 hours, seven days a week. Yeah. Well, I think what I'm gonna do is ask to defer it so we can get so we don't put the permit through and then you can't operate anyway, but work with, keep my office in the loop so we make sure that we can address this um, with development services. I'd second the deferral. Okay, we've got a motion and a second for a deferral for two weeks, presumably. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. All right, 9D3, this is a special permit to operate a spectator sports and entertainment uh, general use with accessory mixed beverage service and PUD 1584 at 8590 Broadway Extension. Councilwoman Nice. Um, um, is the applicant here? Well, I know we don't have any uh, protests and this is on final hearing. So with that, I move for approval. Second. So this is to allow drinking in a movie theater, is this correct? That's what it is. This okay. is going to be a Flix brew house. Yeah, it's, okay. uh, well, just, just a little point of personal privilege. I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into authoring the bill that made this legal. So Appreciate that. <laughs> it's kind of exciting for me to be on the other end of it now. So I would like to add my voice then real quick. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I had, we were just joking, Councilwoman Hammond and I, last week, I had a friend who's a fellow movie critic, and they were like, oh, James, there's not going to be a day where all these... Uh, movie theaters are going to want to do the alcohol and all this stuff like Alamo Draft House and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, make sure you come to Ward 7 and enjoy <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> all right. Did you make a motion? We did and we okay. had it second. All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right. Uh, 9E was deferred to June 4th. At the beginning of the meeting, 9F is an ordinance on final hearing establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled uh, within an existing layby on the north side of Northwest 25th Street from approximately 42 feet west to 74 feet west of the West Curb Line in North Classic. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Councilman Cooper. Is anyone, here, is anyone here to speak to this specific item? No. Right, well, I would move approval. Okay, got a motion? Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9G is an ordinance on final hearing granting, granting to Veolia Energy um, the revocable use of certain designated streets, alleys, and public ways, etc. I believe we had a presentation on this before. So this is now final consideration of that grant. And then we need that with the emergency. That's the one that allows them to be able to provide the services to the convention center. Okay. So that would be two votes then, correct? Right. Move the item. Okay, we've got a motion and a second for uh, the ordinance. Um, seeing no discussion, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Move the item as an emergency. Now the emergency vote, motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. 9H, this is an ordinance to be introduced today, set for final hearing on June 4th, adopting and ratifying the assessment role for Street Improvement Assessment District number 1627 and Silverhawk Phase 1 Edition, et cetera. And I believe we have a presentation. Yes, uh, Eric Winger, our Public Works Director, will give us a quick overview on this item. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This was an item that we actually had deferred from our last meeting due to an error that was in the attachment, but it's since been corrected. And so what's in your packet today um, is what you're considering. So um, this is the public hearing. The final hearing on this item is set for June the 4th. This is a, an assessment district for street work um, in the Silverhawk um, District. Um, this is the process that I described um, previously where there are private roads in Oklahoma City that have opportunities through assessment districts to be converted to public roads. Um, it's a lengthy process, um, but it starts with a petition. Um, it goes through a process of being heard by this council, engineering plans being provided with estimates, the district then agreeing that they want to move the project forward, the bidding of work, um, ultimately the assignment of a contractor to the work to complete the work. And we're at that point now that this work has been completed um, and we are now ready to set the assessment role, which is the amount at which the project was completed, $132,254. There's 30 owners in the area, and so their assessment by lot will be $4,408. And so this is done over a period of time. 
Um, they do have the option to just pay it singly if they want, but it is placed on their property tax bill annually to allow them to pay this over time. Um, with your approval today, um, it'll authorize the city clerk to be able to file with the county that assessment roll. There'll be a final action of this council that would then come back where you'll actually issue the bonds. So the way that the project works is that the contractor does the work for bonds and this council will issue those and complete the process. So with the that- The collects to pay it out over time. Is there an interest component? So there is an interest component, not over the time, but there's an interest component on the bond itself. So the benefit is to the contractor completing the work is actually paid work plus interest. But, uh, but again, the cost that you see here is an established cost on that role. Any further questions for Eric? Okay. Thank you, Eric. Well, we would need a motion to introduce the ordinance for its consideration. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That will be set for final hearing on June 4th. Brings us to page 26 in your printed agenda, item 9I1. This is a public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures listed here. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak under this public hearing portion of the meeting regarding these dilapidated structures? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt a resolution found at 9I2 declaring that the structures are dilapidated. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9J1 is a public hearing regarding the unsecured structures listed here, except for the ones uh, removed by the city manager at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, is there anyone here who wishes to speak under this public hearing? Uh, Mayor, I want to yes. um, uh, see 2415 North Highland. I got a phone call from that, uh, and I know she came this morning, so do we need to? Okay. Uh, that's correct. Chad Davidson, Code Enforcement. I did speak with uh, Victoria Kemp, and she's going to secure that property today. We're going to check it this afternoon uh, for compliance. Okay. Um, then I, I think if you go ahead and, and um, declare it, then we would not file a lien on the property if it is secured at that time. Um, it, it won't become official until we file that lien. I, can I, I just want to, yeah, let's defer it. And, okay. And then we'll just make sure uh, to work with that. So I want to defer C. Okay, so that's a motion for to defer item 9, J1C. Second? In, in that order. Second. <laughs> yes, second. please. All right. At uh, motion and a second, any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That item is deferred. Uh, we're back on the public hearing of 9J1 J and the items listed here. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on any of those items? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the resolution found at 9J2, declaring that the structures are unsecured. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. This applies to the items listed here, except for the one deferred just now and the ones uh, stricken at the beginning of the meeting. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we're at 9K1. This is a public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings listed here, except for the ones uh, stricken by the city manager at the beginning of the meeting. Is there any, anyone here who wishes to speak on any of these abandoned buildings? With this one, this will also add uh, 9K1C to that oh, list. Oh, that's well. correct. Okay, we'd like to we'll defer that to as well. Okay. Defer that as well. Does anyone like to second that motion? Second. Got a motion and a second for deferring that same item from previously consider previous consideration. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, and that leaves us with everything else. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on any of these items? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion for 9K2, resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we are at 9L1, a resolution approving the request for salary continuation for Major Leroy Montano, uh, et cetera. I do not believe we need executive session. I'd entertain a motion to adopt the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9M1 is a resolution authorizing the municipal counselor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of uh, Kepler and Kepler v. City of Oklahoma City. I don't believe we need executive session, so I'd entertain a motion for the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
Brings us to 9N1, uh, a resolution to approve an MOU between uh, the city and the IAFF. And I believe we would like, staff would like an executive session here. So uh, I would entertain a motion for 9N2, and then potentially we would consider 9N1 after executive session. Kenny, would that be your advice? Okay. Okay, so uh, we've got a motion and a second to go into executive session. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. We'll handle that executive session at the end of our other business, come back here and potentially consider 9N1. Um, 901 is a claim recommended for denial, but that was deferred, correctly? Right. Yeah, to, at the beginning of the meeting. So we'll move to 10A1, claims recommended for approval. I do, don't believe we need executive session. I don't believe, is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Seeing none, is there a motion on the table? Got a motion and a second. And uh, any further discussion on the claims recommended for approval? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Uh, brings us to items from council, item 11 on the agenda. Uh, we'll handle the business before we go around the horseshoe. And uh, so we'll start with 11A. This is a resolution approving travel and reimbursement of travel related expenses for Councilman James Cooper to attend the Congress for New Urbanism uh, June 11th through the 15th. Six votes are required for approval. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then we have items B and C that are related. And I've been advised that the best approach is perhaps to pull up item C first. So 11C. And I'll kind of turn the floor over to Councilman Cooper and Councilman Stonecipher. Councilman Stonecipher, would you like to begin, actually? What, I, I have some things I want to say, but I talk quite a bit, so I'd like to hear uh, from you first. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to take up the Memorandum of Understanding first. And uh, I think it's, it's a good idea to give a little historical background on this. Um, as uh, Ed Shadid said, I dated myself when I told everybody that I graduated from high school in this building, and it's very near and dear to my heart, and I wanted to do everything I could to preserve it. And so with that, I sat down with the uh, petitioners, uh, and visited with Lynn. Uh, I also sat down uh, with the Reverend, which was here a minute ago, but uh, there he is, uh, and just wanted to see where we were really at with the thing and what was going on and were there potential buyers out there. And at the time, there really didn't appear to be any imminent sale or imminent fear that there were actually going to be a demolition. And so um, I had heard that Crossings about a year ago had looked at this, uh, at this building. And so I reached out to Crossings and asked them if they would uh, be interested in looking at this item again. And uh, I thought it was best um, to keep the lawyers, uh, the real estate agents, and the uh, city staff out of the room. And so a representative from the church, from both churches, met uh, at a coffee house, had a cup of coffee, I uh, thought they'd talk about what each other needed. Uh, that, that conversation led to a two and a half hour meeting. Uh, a week later, uh, those two gentlemen brought both the reverends from each church and they sat down and had another meeting. And we now, as a result of people sitting down and talking, um, have a purchase and sale agreement. And we now have a church crossings that's looking at um, hiring inspectors to do its due diligence, determine if it can move forward with the closing, which is something we all hope will happen. But there is this issue that we wanted to make sure that um, certain people's concerns were protected. And uh, I think this memorandum of understanding brought into the room uh, lawyers, real estate agents, reverends, a whole group of people. And through a, a lengthy process, I think we were able to come up with something that everyone can live with, uh, that will work well for everyone. And most importantly, we'll make sure that this PSA moves forward uh, because within the purchase and sale agreement, uh, the crossings has the right to walk away from this project if there is a landmark designation. So is it the perfect MOU? Uh, probably not. Uh, when you come up with a compromise, uh, sometimes you meet in the middle. And I think that uh, everybody worked hard here. We came up with an MOU I think that's workable, doable, and most importantly, is in the best interest of these buildings located at 36th and Walker. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I'd like to ask our, one of our municipal counselors, Amanda Carpenter, to speak to the specifics of what this MOU uh, accomplishes. And um, yeah, take it there. 
Sure, Amanda Carpenter, Deputy Municipal Counselor. Um, this MOU provides uh, terms that are agreed to by all three parties. That's First Christian Church, Crossings Community Church, and the City of Oklahoma City. It specifically provides that in exchange for the City of Oklahoma City withdrawing its application to designate the property as a historic landmark, that both First Christian Church and Crossings agree they will not seek to demo the buildings that include this sanctuary, the education center, and the jewel box theater. Um, demo in this agreement provide, means that they will not seek to demolish, tear down, knock down the external structures of those buildings. Um, First Christian Church agrees to do that during the time that they are under contract with Crossings. Crossings is also agreeing to not demo those buildings during the, any time, any point in time that they own the building. Uh, the city also is agreeing that we will not initiate a designation of um, historic landmark status while Crossings owns the building. However, Crossings is um, committed and has a contractual obligation to provide us notice of any potential sale and notice of that closing to ensure that we have the ability as the city of Oklahoma City, should the city council want to initiate a um, historic landmark designation either on the date of closing or shortly thereafter. There's also another provision in this agreement where Crossings Communities Community Church provides a right of first refusal that should Crossings want to sell the property in the future, the City of Oklahoma City will be provided 30 days to determine whether or not it would like to purchase that property. There is no financial commitment in this agreement that the city has to purchase the property. It's merely giving the opportunity and giving those 30 days for the city of Oklahoma City to make a decision on how it would like to proceed, either through the purchase or other action, should it um, decide to take that other action if Crossings is selling the property. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the any other specifics. Okay. I thank you want to thank you, Amanda, so much for the work you did um, with Councilman Stonecipher, with the Reverend, with the Crossings, with the attorneys. I, I am truly in awe of what you've accomplished and what we've all been able to accomplish together. So really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. You're very welcome, and thank, <laughs> thank you to both of you. Thank you. And then, just briefly, uh, you, oh, you don't have to keep standing. Uh, <laughs> um, just briefly, I just wanted to speak to why this was something I, um, that really mattered to me, and it's something I've already said to um, both Crossings and First Christian. It's you, uh, Councilman Stonecipher, have been mentioning how much you've enjoyed uh, Councilwoman Nice mentioning history, so if you'll permit me for just a moment, I'd like to speak from where my deep sense of religious liberty dwells and why it was so important for us to preserve First Christian. Uh, a quick story. There's a man, Richard Allen, and in 1786, he was a slave, and he w was caught up in a religious revival at the time, uh, this evangelical movement that was happening in the north part of our country that said that to have slaves was uh, to commit a mortal sin. This was a whole new way of looking at slavery, and these evangelical Christians took it further. They said, well, then we must abolish slavery, and not only can the individual slave master be redeemed, but the entire country could be redeemed with the abolishing of slavery, forgiven for the sin. Well, Richard Allen gets caught up in that. He then takes one of these pastors to his slave master. The slave master hears this message, and they're able to convince the slave master to set him free. He goes to Philadelphia, Richard Allen does. While he's in uh, Philadelphia, He's invited to speak in an all-white church. And imagine these pews. Also imagine up there where the media sits that that's a balcony. While Richard Allen has been invited to speak, he sits in the front row. He is tapped on the shoulder and told, you cannot sit here. This is for white folk only. He sits there with his good friend and he goes, hmm, yeah, I'm going to pray on that. Prays on it and decides to decides to put in motion this country's very first nonviolent peaceful sit-in. 1786, Philadelphia at the time, the most thriving city in the country at the time, thriving black population. He sat in and then he got up and as he put it, he never looked back. He bought a building, a structure, and he built the AME church, the first black church in America. 
as this whole conversation was happening, even before I stepped foot on the city council about First Christian, and then even before crossings became involved, this story of Richard Allen really haunted me because today, AME has over 7,000 congregations across the world. One of its most famous congregants was a woman named Rosa Parks. I wonder what story was in her head when she decided to sit in at the front of that bus. She knew the history. She knew what Richard Allen had accomplished. And all I kept thinking throughout this whole conversation was what would happen in Philadelphia if Mother Bethel, the first black church, came across dire financial straits? Would the city of Philadelphia not have a moral, ethical, religious obligation to step in and preserve that building? I would argue absolutely. I remember a problematic man, but all the same, a courageous man, William uh, Winston Churchill, also said during the height of World War II, as people were saying, run, we, we have to leave the art behind. He's like, well, if we're going to leave the art behind, what are we fighting for? We are fighting for these buildings. We are fighting for our culture and what we have created. We must preserve it. I teach at Jefferson Middle School. And at Jefferson, I've really gotten into the history of Thomas Jefferson, who defended the Baptists. This is another little story I think is important here. It's the birth of religious liberty in our country. He defended the Baptists, even though he did not agree with a single word they believed. He did not believe in the supernatural elements of the Bible. He cut them out of the Bible. That's why we have what's called the Jefferson Bible now. He cut them out. He believed in the teachings of Jesus so much, but he did not believe in any of the miracles. So he has that Bible created, defends the Baptists against the Anglican Christians who are jailing Baptist preachers for preaching, quote, without a license. He defends them, and he says, even though I don't believe what you believe, you have a right in this country to believe it. I suspect he believed that because in Spain, just a couple hundred years earlier, the same day Christopher Columbus sailed over here to America, Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain, kicked out Muslims, kicked out Jews, had been living peacefully beside Christians that whole time. He did not want that to be our fate here in America. He thought we as Christians, as Muslims, as Jews, as non-believers, were endowed by our creator to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is at the heart of my belief in religious liberty. And the man who blew up our Murrah building did not believe that. He did not believe that Jewish people had a place in this country. He did not believe that people of color had a place in this country. And he took innocent lives as a result of that hateful, harmful, old ideology. And it was First Christian Church that provided sanctuary, medical care to the people in the immediate aftermath of that bombing. And that is why we are preserving that building. It is not only a part of our country's religious history, it is a part of our city's Oklahoma standard history. That's deep. But it must be said, and that is why we are preserving this church and property rights. I want to thank Councilman Stone Cipher from the very bottom of my heart for slowing down with me, for walking <laughs> with me. I want to thank First Christian. I want to thank Crossings and David Box and Amanda and the mayor and council for being here in this moment. Thank you for letting me go on like that. But I just thought it was really important that we understand why this was so important. So thank you. I would like to move the item. Thank you. We actually have someone who has signed up to speak. So before we consider that, I might ask uh, Lynn Rostashil to come forward. Okay, so you do not wish to speak on item C, the MOU. Not, not, not. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, so you've got a motion on the table for C, and you uh, seconded it, correct? Okay. Your Honor. Yes, counsel. May I speak? Yes. So, I'm opposed to this uh, memorandum of understanding. I don't believe it's necessary. Both parties have indicated they have no intentions of, of destroying the building. Uh, the best thing we could do is stay out of these negotiations completely and let the two parties move forward with this. Um, now, some of the things I may say, I have to qualify by saying, first of all, I'm not an attorney, so this isn't deemed to be legal advice. It's just an individual's opinion. But uh, the concept of duress Coercion is, is certainly present in this, 
extended uh, process that's been going on since March. That would invalidate the agreement. Uh, the concept of consideration, what, these, what at least one of these churches is receiving is our agreement that we will not pursue historic preservation uh, designation. We shouldn't be doing that to begin with. They've asked not to uh, receive that type of designation. Uh, and, and James, I'm afraid, you know, I appreciate you bringing up the concept of religion and how it's so important to this country. But another perspective that this proposed agreement creates is, is going back to the First Amendment, which says a government cannot prohibit the free exercise of religion. And when we get involved in, in these types of transactions, we are uh, complicating matters and uh, we are prohibiting the free exercise of, of one church's uh, efforts to sell the building that they can no longer afford. We've not paid anything towards the original uh, construction of this church or the ongoing maintenance. In fact, we can't. We're prohibited by the same First Amendment. We cannot establish a, a quote, government religion, meaning we can't give preference, financial support, to one religion over another. The best thing we can do is to stay completely out of this process let one church sell its facility to another church. The proposed buyer has no interest in destroying it. In fact, they've came out and talked about all the monies they're going to put into it. So let these two parties settle this on their own. Let's not go forward with this uh, memorandum of understanding, but let's do proceed to item B and uh, correct a serious problem that has already occurred in, in uh, the Historic Preservation Commission's efforts. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion on item uh, 11C? Councilman McAtee. A question. I, I think David raised a couple of interesting points that I'd like somebody to art articulate on, Kenny, uh, and that is the uh, memorandum of understanding is it's been brought forth. Does that get involved in First Amendment rights, uh, number one? And then secondly, uh, does it affect uh, private property rights in, in any way? Could Amanda speak to that as our legal voice on this? Sure. Um, the negotiated deal does not affect their property rights in any way. It was simply that, a negotiated deal in exchange for agreeing to not demo these buildings during their ownership as well as during the time that they're under contract. We um, agreed to both rescind the current HP application and not seek an application in the future while they own the property. So that's a negotiated uh, land transaction, um, negotiated contract between the parties. So there's no no restriction on their property rights that they haven't voluntarily agreed to. Um, as for First Amendment, we believe that there's no First Amendment, potential First Amendment cause of action in this situation because one, First Christian continues to um, have their religious practice as we sit here today, will continue to have it during the time that Cross is, is doing its due diligence. And then after, if Crossings does acquire the property, Crossings will also be able to continue its religious practice as it sees fit in that building. Okay. Uh, again, this is not an attorney speaking. This is not legal advice. So duress does not mean the imminent, imminent uh, uh, physical or financial harm against one party to a contract. For example, Let's say a first-time buyer of an automobile goes into a car dealership and naively thinks that they'll be treated fairly. And some car dealerships do that. But let's say you bring in your existing vehicle and you finally identify a car that you're interested in. Next thing you know, they've, they've asked for your keys. They're going to you know, 
evaluated to see how much they'll give you on a trade-in. But by that point, you've decided, oh, I don't think I'm going to go through with this contract. Well, now the salesperson has brought in their sales manager, perhaps even a third party, and you don't feel like you have the ability to get up and leave. One, you don't even have your car keys at this point in time. Courts have ruled in that situation you, you were under duress when, you're in, when you entered into that contract. Ever since uh, we first got involved with this, uh, First Christian Church has asked, if not pleaded with us, not to give historic preservation designation designation to the church and we failed to uh, uh, comply with that. This agreement almost forces them into historical preservation. The only difference because they can no longer uh, make uh, any decisions with respect to not only the church but all the other structures those other structures don't uh, have a historical or an architectural uh, uh, significance, but yet we want to control all that. The only difference is they could make modifications without coming before the HP Commission under the terms of this uh, MOU. Outside of that, it, it's the same as receiving historical preservation. Uh, again, Amanda may not believe there's been uh, any duress, that it's been a free uh, will uh, situation, but I suspect there's more than just a couple of attorneys who would take this up. Here's the other problem. We've now entered in and created a, uh, a level of risk that if this sale does not go through, all First Christian Church has to do is point to the actions of the city of Oklahoma City, and now we're on the hook. There's this term called lost profits. When individuals, businesses, governments interfere with transactions to the point that it sours the deal, they're subject to uh, 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 claims by the uh, injured party and we have to make up any lost profits that we've created by our efforts. Again, both parties are willing to preserve this church. They want this transaction to go forward. Let's leave them alone and let them do this as private organizations. We have no, uh, no need to get involved with this. Councilman Stonecipher, would you like to speak to crossing about crossings right now in this instance, um, and and the, I mean, just in terms of. I mean, the only thing I would say is that, um, like I said before, two people sat down in a coffee shop on Northwestern, thought they were going to visit for about 15 minutes. They visited for two and a half hours. They understood each other's needs after that. A week later, they met with their ministers and discussed it further, and they voluntarily moved forward. Um, at that point did get real estate agents, lawyers, and city staff involved, and it was a productive process. No one, uh, anyone could have walked away from the process at any moment if they didn't want to go forward. And um, my, uh, one of my mentors is a guy by the name of Judge Lee West. He sits on the federal court uh, in the Western District, well, he just retired, in the Western District of Oklahoma. And he always uh, said, um, when you come up with a compromise, uh, not everybody's happy. Not, everybody thinks somebody else got something they shouldn't. Have. And that's what compromise is about, both sides giving. And both sides gave here, and both sides are comfortable with where they're at, and both sides want to move forward. Uh, I know that, for example, with crossings, uh, they have been visiting with uh, uh, the, first, the group at First National to see who their inspectors are so they can begin inspection on the mechanical integrity, the structural integrity, other aspects of the building, and they are ecstatic about the prospect of reviving this as a new uh, component of Crossings Church. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Can I Stone? ask a question real quick? What is the purpose of having all the other buildings included in the MOU? 
Or are they all included in it? They are, right? Yeah, they're, they're all interconnected, number one. Number two, uh, they are just as historical as the other, the sanctuary itself. For example, the, the look back on the history of the Jewel Box Theater, uh, it's uh, phenomenal, uh, the, the historical presence in this community. And so uh, they're all together, uh, they're all interconnected. Uh, it makes sense to, to do all three. Is there an, anything else you would add to that? I'm sure the original uh, discussion was involving the Jewel Box Theater as well as the sanctuary, which some commonly refer to as the egg. And then the education uh, center was added um, at the suggestion of the other side during our, dis our negotiations and discussions. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. Uh, does anyone else have any comments or questions? All right, seeing none, let's cast our votes. Passes eight to one. And uh, now we'll go back to 11B. Now, to clarify, 11C has the language of 11B incorporated. So I don't know if 11B is necessary at this point. You could withdraw it. It may be it, overkill, but I would defer to Amanda. I think it, it, the safe thing to do would be to, to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, resolution that was passed was the, approving the MOU and, with, and rescinding the application that was initiated by HP because that was the consideration that was part of the MOU. So item B is no longer necessary. It can be stricken. Okay. Um, would you like I'll, to withdraw I'll defer, the... I'll defer to Amanda. <laughs> okay. Well, can I say something? Sure, sure. What? Why don't you come up then uh, and speak while, while we all mold this over. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lynn Rostischel. Uh, I live at 3209 Robin Ridge uh, Road. Thank you. I love what you've done with the Lester Mansion. Thank you. Um, I really love this agreement. I thank Crossings very much and First Christian for coming together. I'm very excited. Um, about the future of the church and uh, really uh, appreciate the agreement. The thing I am worried about is uh, rescinding the motion uh, put forward by uh, the HP Commission to do the study to make it a historic landmark. You know, to me, this is really undermining their authority, it's taking away their powers, and it's setting a very bad precedent for the future. If they make a decision and someone's not happy with it, then they can come to you. And I just really don't like the idea of their powers being watered down. It could impact other committees and other uh, commissions as well. It sets a really bad precedent. And um, the thing I don't understand is the study will come back to you with a recommendation. You will have the final vote anyway. Why thwart the process if you probably have the votes to knock it down anyway? You know, it just seems to me that um, it's just a really bad precedent. It really waters down their authority and um, could have people coming back to them saying, oh, well, city council did this, so now I don't need to listen to you. I can just go to city council and they'll make your decision go away. So, thank you. Um, go ahead, James. Go ahead. Uh, I would say the reason was because uh, this whole process was going to put a financial burden on the church, and the church didn't want to go through it. That's not what I'm arguing, though. I'm so not arguing that's why that. We, that's why we were going to withdraw it, so they didn't have to go through all that, just to be more efficient. Because uh, if, if there weren't five votes on the council to approve it anyway, then, then what was the point of going through it all? Well, what is the point of just letting the process happen? You're going to get the vote. There is no financial burden for that. I mean, all of their due diligence can begin without that. Well, but they were going to have to pay a lawyer that whole time. So, so Not to, to do due diligence now because they're just doing the study. There's no vote on so, it. So just to clarify, we already did this. So it is this, though this is an interesting academic conversation, it happened in the, in the vote held a few minutes ago. So, um, Okay. Thank may, you. May I ask a related question. Mm -hmm. I was told just before I took office that the planning department is going through a process right now of looking through uh, structures across the whole city to see what might be 
uh, up for a historical landmark designation. Is that true? And where or we something new, maybe maybe in a new process or some kind. Oh, I <laughs> yeah. So they're in the process of looking at doing an HP plan update, right? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm Katie Friddle. I'm staff to the planning department and the program planner for historic preservation. I wasn't here to answer that question, but I am happy to. Um, we are in the final um, stages of developing a citywide historic preservation plan. Um, the plan is not a site-by-site -site comprehensive list of every structure that should be a landmark. It's more of a policy document of how we as a city can, in a variety of ways, encourage and support historic preservation. Um, but it does talk about proactively identifying historic properties, working with those property owners to see that those buildings are rehabilitated and protected. So it's not a it's not a list, um, so but I it is. It was a list. It's there's a, no it's, list being prepared of no. Properties. There's there's not a. Um, we have all sorts of data and surveys that have been conducted that identify historic properties, but it's not a list of these should be landmarks that's going to be slid across your desks. Um, in the immediate future. I would like us to figure out some sort of way, if not like necessarily sliding them to us, saying like, you know, rubber stamping, these are historical. Mm -hmm. But at least I would like to see a list of properties across the city that have historical significance to the development of this place. Because one of the things that did bother me about the HP conversation that happened with First Christian was, you know, it, we find out it's up for sale, and then we came in and had this conversation mm -hmm. about HP. I would like to have those conversations way ahead of time um, so that we can begin those conversations with those property owners to find out where they are, what they're up to, what they're thinking about. You know, I just would like, to your point, I'd like to see us be proactive. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, That's, we, we hope that the plan will, will move us in that direction. Thank you. And I think it's also worth, you know, as you indicated, coming up with some sort of strategy on these properties um, uh, uh, separate from the HL, because though we certainly always as a council have that power, that is highly unlikely that we're probably ever going to get seven votes, you know, which is what it requires, you know, for, for over the property owner's objection. So what else can we do, though? And I think what you're, it sounds like what you're doing is preparing that, yeah. so that's good. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll get to that as well of having, there's recommendations in there, um, drafted recommendations about other tools that we can be um, taking greater advantage of to encourage preservation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see also how, um, even with this and, and staff and planning, um, how we are being proactive when it comes to our Capital Medical Zoning Association and historic landmarks there, because uh, that's why we, we were in a bind when it came to the Brockway Center. Um, and a lot of Northeast Oklahoma City is under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's very difficult for us to, to make that determination when you have the Capital Medical Zoning uh, making that determination over our determination. Yeah. Uh, so that's also a concern. Is is that state law, Kenny? I mean, is that? Yes. Yes, that Capital Medical Zoning Commission is state law. You can monitor what they're doing and you can add, have input to them, but it's actually controlled by them. Yeah, we'd have to change state law to. And that's not my argument. Okay. My argument is to make sure we're also adding to their board. Uh, we have to obviously talk to our local officials about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to be intentional about who we are adding. Uh, to that committee and to that historic landmark preservation area uh, to make sure that it's people that are actually from the community and not people that are, we're just throwing on these boards. So, that's so do we have, a, we have a, re a city representative on the? We do. We do. Who is it? Um, it is, one of them is, um, I, can't, I can't remember. Okay, well, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Uh, Janice Powers, but she's on the advisory board, but they have their own um, historic landmark, if I'm not mistaken, as far as... Yes, at one point in time, they said it, there, there, there was language that said that the chair of the city's HP commission was supposed to serve on their board, and then we figured out that wasn't actually allowed. Um, I don't remember the specifics of all of that, but that's something that has been, I think they've been working through. So but that, I think that's a very good point about having coordination between the two. So it sounds like we need more conversation on that. Okay. And I'd like to... To second James' comments on Amanda, she put this together at a very, very short notice <laughs> and did a great job as always. James. She did a great job. Now I know she can get stuff done and I thought it would take a couple weeks and two days. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
And my commendations to Councilman Cooper and Councilman Stonecipher for working together so hard over the last couple of weeks to get this done. Well, we're now back at 11B. Um, you had a couple minutes to think about it, Councilman Stonecipher. Do you want to withdraw it, I guess? Okay. And that's a, is that an, ex can he do that? Is that a satisfactory outcome, Francis, procedurally? There's actually three other authors, so I guess if they all come it already was done. So we're, that's uh, uh, Councilman Greenwell. So explain that to me. So, so the language uh, of, of item B was withdrawing that, that HL process, but in item C, the exact same language appeared, and it was, so it was accomplished in, in that resolution that incidentally you voted against, but that was. <laughs> no, I understand. So by voting for C, it automatically withdrew the Correct. Correct. Designation. Correct. If you concur, you withdraw B. So the, so the question was, you concur with not pursuing B since it's moot yeah. at this point? If Kenny says that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> you did the same thing. The yeah. same thing in both resolutions as far as withdrawing it. Councilman Stone? Yeah. Councilman Greiner? Yeah. Okay. All right. Consider that uh, item 11B to be withdrawn. And that concludes our docketed business under items from council, but we'll go around the horseshoe. Councilman Stonecipher? Nothing today. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, I have a couple things. Um, one, with the weather that we had this weekend, 1OKC has been moved to June 8th, so we want everyone to put that on their calendars and join us on Northeast 23rd Street from Rhode Island to Hood Street. Um, also, I uh, had a chance to meet with some wonderful young women over the weekend with the Carl Albert Center New Leadership Program uh, with some women, uh, traditional and non-traditional college students from across the state learning about uh, government and how it works and how they can move the needle forward. I uh, also want to commend the class of 2019. Uh, we had a lot of graduates this year and a lot of scholarships that were given uh, away went to Douglas High School to see those young people receive those uh, accomplishments and that was amazing to see all of the, the great exciting things to come for those young people. Uh, as well as our two youth council members that we have for Ward 7 and I went to one of their graduations. She goes to Crooked Oak so excited about her future as well. And, we're waiting for our other young lady. I know she hasn't graduated yet, but she will be this year. Um, I want to thank also Chris Browning and the utilities. And we went to tour. It was myself, the city manager. He let me drive him around. Um, <laughs> in the, <laughs> yeah, I, thank you. I tried my hardest not to crash that thing. Uh, but we drove, we toured both water plants. And I must say uh, thank you to our staff, especially, was his name Dusty, the gentleman? He, he was, Dustin was amazing as far as uh, being knowledgeable about how we treat our water and uh, the, how we are able to sustain our water and the things that are happening at both plants. And uh, also thank you to Chris Browning for saving me from a, a baby <laughs> rattlesnake. I'll tell you about that later if you ask me. Uh, but we had a, a great tour and I must say again thank you to the staff for all that you do because it definitely makes a difference. Again, I want to address the not resolution but proclamation, Mayor, <laughs> for the Charlie Christian International Jazz Festival. Again, we are excited and I encourage you all if you have not heard of Charlie Christian and the wonderful things that he did in his lifetime at an early age. Uh, that if you do that, he definitely left us way too early, but he did leave a lot of legacy behind uh, being born and raised in the Deep Deuce area. Now, last week, uh, I did say I was going to bring up something uh, from a newspaper article, so I want to do that now. And with that, I want to define the word diversity. From dictionary.com, it is the inclusion of individuals representing more than one national origin, color, religion, socioeconomic stratum, or sexual orientation. Uh, the article that was written made mention of uh, the ethnic backgrounds of two individuals. And previously, in my comments that came from this article, I never mentioned any ethnic backgrounds. And that was very intentional because I asked for diversity when it came uh, to the conversation at hand. And with, again, 
diversity, it does not mean strictly color. It means all of these things that I have defined. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful uh, when the intent of words are coming from my mouth or any of our mouths as council members and when it is displayed and written in a, with a different intent. Um, so I was very disappointed in that because that took away from the conversation that should have been had as far as inclusion and diversity. Um, and I hope further when we are talking about diversity and inclusion, we're not just mentioning black and white because not only am I black, I'm also a woman. So that is my intersectionality when it comes to a lot of different things when I'm talking about a conversation. So I just hope uh, when it's reported about things that we are saying that it, those specifics are also taken into account with the words that we are using. And uh, with Capital Medical Zoning Association, they will be meeting on this Friday at 8.15 a.m. for those who live within the ward um, who have some concerns about some things that are happening within our Capital Medical Zoning Association. So I will close with that. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank um, a few of the organizers from this Sunday's Critical Mass. Um, Chris Dahlgren, Sam Day, Kate Nickel, and Ben Knuckles, along with lots of other folks, um, organized a bike ride that I think we had over 100 people join us from across the city. Um, and we met at McKinley Park, um, just south of the Plaza District, and um, talked about, I'll probably let Councilman Cooper <laughs> Uh, expound on what he talked about there, but um, it was just, a, and we rode up Classen um, with a protected bike lane, um, and then took a few different routes around the city um, through Uptown and then um, down to Capitol Hill. I did not go that far, because riding 12 miles on my bicycle is not something I'm interested in doing, um, but a few people did, and um, and then we all met up at Mesta Park afterwards, and um, to me it was really eye-opening. I ride my bike, by myself most of the time. I don't really ride in groups very often because I'm just going to the store, going to volunteer somewhere on an errand. Um, and it really, um, especially, specifically on class and that protected bike lane, really exampled to me the um, power of the visibility um, aspect of what a critical mass is about and making sure that, um, you know, a mass of people is on class and on bicycles is a lot different than a lone person. Um, which, you know, I think most people who ride a bike to get around typically, you know, I actually had this conversation with someone on Sunday, um, you know, about the wonky little weird ways we get around the city because trying to cross Classen or Lincoln um, or even 23rd at some places, 39th, um, is just really perilous and a little terrifying. Um, and, you know, seeing everyone from, I mean, like age five to um, older folks joining us, um, you know, folks in the service industry, people um, who work for uh, businesses and banks. Um, it was just really, really um, neat to see that cross-section of our city, um, of our population residents um, coming together to say that we as a city and as residents um, who come from various socioeconomic statuses, um, mental health uh, or substance abuse backgrounds, all really deserve a healthy and accessible way to get around the city, whether that be um, walking, biking, uh, or even sometimes driving a car. So I just wanted to point out how great that was. And um, hopefully, it sounds like we might be having another one in the future. So uh, we'll keep you posted. But I'd encourage anyone to join that wasn't able to make it Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, I just had the privilege of spending six days in another part of our country, and it was very interesting. You're talking about diversity. It's very interesting to listen to people and their diverse ideas about subjects. And I think the more we listen and the less we talk, the better off I'm going to be anyway. Thank you. Thank you. And to Councilman McAtee's point, when we did that bike ride on Sunday, we started, as Councilwoman Hammond said, at McKinley Park, and then rode across the city. I actually did all 12 miles. My body is reminding me that this morning. Um, but we ended at a park. We ended at Mesta Park. We didn't stop at a bar. And this became part of the conversation that we had. 
a lot of people in our 20s and our 30s, we know we like to go and we have a good time at the bars and the clubs, and that's all well and good. But when we are in a park, it allows for back and forth, like listening to someone speak at length, listening to them, and then respond, like thinking about what they've just said and then responding. So what the mayor called a bit of an academic exercise earlier, and then what we did during this conversation about the MOU, I love those moments. Like, I live for those moments of disagreement, of tension. My principal calls it when you stretch the rubber band, right? And you know it's just going to pop, but you just keep stretching it just a little bit. Yeah, and I think we need to be in our parks more, like, so that bars are loud and there's TVs and there's lots of all that, but a park and a blanket, I mean, it, the conversation, I think that's so missing right now. And that ride really reminded me of that. Um, I'm looking forward to working with Embark and Public Works to figure out how we can uh, work with the residents in Ward 2 and Ward 6 as we um, talk about a BRT on Classen and figuring out ways that we can have that street be for everyone, for cars, for a protected bike lane, for uh, pedestrians on sidewalks. Uh, how do we do that? And uh, I'm really looking forward to being a part of that conversation. I would be remiss in concluding, however, if I did not say congratulations to Jefferson Middle School, my seventh and eighth graders, my eighth graders who are graduating and going to ninth grade. Uh, this is my last uh, week with them. Uh, we'll be here on Thursday for a field trip at City Hall, but it's truly been the honor of my life listening to them. Um, tell me what they think will make our city even better and what will keep them here. And uh, spoiler, it involved parks. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, city Manager reports, item 13. Right, so first up we have uh, Jason Fairbrush, our Public Transportation and Parking Director, is going to give us an update on bus shelters. Okay, good morning, uh, Mayor and Council, and Councilman Nice, thank you for the reminder of the 1 OKC event being rescheduled. We were ready with our bus and staff to be there, but um, glad that we're probably going to have better weather next time around. So. Uh, as we get going this morning, I um, just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank uh, Council for allowing a few minutes on the agenda to provide just a quick update in terms of uh, what we're doing to improve our city's transit stops. Um, as you know, and uh, you know, many of us are aware, um, when you look at our transit stops, we have um, lots of stops that need ADA improvements, we need bus benches, um, we need bus shelters, and <clears throat> we are working as staff uh, diligently to address those as aggressively as aggressively as we possibly can um, with the resources and, and the time that we have uh, to look at those issues. Um, so I want to take you back and uh, remind uh, Council of the, the relaunch and the rebranding we did of our bus service back in 2014. Uh, we've talked a lot about how we looked at improving our frequency. We have talked about the directness of the routes, trying to make the system easier to use and more predictable. But one of the other things we initiated during that time was really taking a hard look at um, our bus stops and what would it take to improve those bus stops. And so as we started working through that process, um, there were several, I guess what I would consider to be strategic elements uh, that came about and have really put us in a position uh, to where we are today, able to uh, pretty, um, uh, quickly uh, install uh, shelters and, and bus bench pads. So uh, first of all, um, the COPPA board selected a typical shelter design. And the shelter uh, design that we use now, the standard design, you can see it on the slide here. It's uh, you know, basically um, three solid sides to the shelter to protect from um, the elements, the wind, the rain, and so forth. Um, you'll notice the, the sides are clear glass, so you have the enhanced visibility. Um, really an enhanced feeling of safety when you're at the stop because you have so much visibility. Each of the shelters has a security light along with a, a trash receptacle. Um, once that shelter design was approved, um, you know, we also did some work with the planning department in looking at our uh, uh, street furniture ordinance. Um, that led to some discussions and some renegotiations of the agreement with our advertising vendor. And basically what we came up with there, the COPPA board, they established uh, what I would consider to be an ADA standard in that we are not going to put any new uh, bus benches or bus shelters out in the system without them being 
ADA accessible. Now, we did have a lot of benches that were in the existing right-of-way that were essentially grandfathered in, but any new street furniture would be ADA accessible. And then, of course, um, Council continuing to support um, their priority to make a, a transportation that's the system that works for all residents has certainly helped us keep the momentum going towards improving uh, bus stops. Um, also wanted to mention uh, some of our partner departments because really this has been a, a team effort between the planning department, the maps department, uh, public works, um, general services with their ADA expertise. And so with that, um, even through the MAPS 3 sidewalks program, a lot of those sidewalks were on bus routes, which meant sidewalks were constructed to enhance the, the connectivity of some of our existing uh, bus stops. And then public works, whether it be through their project management services or even uh, through some of the funding sources available uh, with GEO bonds, have, have really uh, made a difference in being able to uh, construct these concrete pads and the connecting sidewalks where we put the shelters. So with the emphasis on improving transit stops uh, for our city, you know, our staff, through our regular strategic business planning process, we developed a bus stop management program. And you can see the purpose statement there. I won't read the entire thing to you, but it is to provide bus stop maintenance and enhancement services so that our customers can have safe, accessible, and convenient bus stops. Um, through this bus stop management program, we have a family of performance measures. We look at things such as the percentage of our bus stops that are ADA accessible. We track the number of new bus shelters that we install on an annual basis. Uh, we look at the percentage of, sh of bus stops that have shelters and benches. We try to track all that information so we can continue to kind of keep score and get better. Um, the slide that you see here is really kind of a, a, a collection of the different type of stops that we manage. We have many stops that are simply a, a, a bus uh, stop pole only with an informational sign. Uh, we have locations where uh, the, we have benches and poles, but we still need some ADA improvements. Um, then we have some locations where we've actually, uh, implement, or we've actually constructed the improvements. Uh, you can see here kind of in the middle the, the, the image of the, of the ADA accessible concrete pad with a, with a bus bench on it, and then of course the shelters that we had mentioned. So, uh, you know, with this emphasis again on, the, on improving bus stops, we know uh, just by driving around, it's intuitive that we have room for improvement, lots of room for improvement with our, with our bus stops. But we also go back and anytime we're looking at making transit system improvements, we always try to also go back to what are our customers, what are our residents saying. And so the next slide here has some information from our latest resident survey. And this is where we're asking residents, which are mainly, in a lot of cases, non-users of the system, you know, what are those important characteristics that would make you consider using the transit system? And you can see that um, frequency and how long it actually uh, takes a person to make a trip are kind of those top indicators. But really, when you look at the results, almost a third of the respondents also indicated that sheltered bus stops are one of the main criteria that um, is important for, you know, again, a bus service that they would consider to be to use. So where does that have us with bus stop improvements? Uh, this pie graph here will give you a sense of kind of the breakdown of our bus stop locations. We have 1,363 total bus stops. Um, within the Embark system, 175 of those, or you can see 13% have a shelter. And I am pleased to report that as we've begun um, emphasizing the need to, to improve our, our bus stops and install shelters, uh, we've actually installed 102 additional shelters since we started this program a few years ago. So we've more, more than doubled the amount of shelters we have in our system. Um, 840 of our bus stops um, currently have a bench, so that's 62%. And then we have 348 of our bus stops, uh, roughly a quarter, that are basically a bus stop pole only. And again, those are locations that when we do end up putting a bench or a shelter, they will be upgraded to be ADA accessible. And then this map here, um, I think I've shared this with you before, and, and we're getting so many uh, different projects on the map, it's really you know, hard to tell exactly where each one is specifically, but really what I hope the takeaway for, for you from this map is, is that the bus stop improvements that have been um, 
completed are throughout the system. They're throughout the city. Particularly if you look at the green dots, those are the 102 new Brasco shelters that we've built. You can see they're, they're really spread throughout the system. Um, we've also completed 24 uh, stop upgrades during this calendar year. So that could be um, a shelter pad, that could be a bus bench pad. And then we have 21 stop upgrades that are still in progress. And so of those basically 45 um, locations that we're upgrading, I would expect at least half of those um, to also receive shelters. So the next few slides that I have here, just really just some examples of some of the new shelters and, and uh, improvements that we've uh, completed, again, with the assistance of Public Works and other departments. So this is a, a bus stop at Reno in May. Uh, this uh, uh, bus shelter actually uh, serves Route 9. Uh, Route 9 uh, basically provides service along Reno out to the um, uh, Reno and MacArthur area at our mini hub, which we refer to as Greenfield Center Place. Uh, one of the interesting things about Route 9, it is one of our highest performing routes in terms of riders per service hour at 25.31 riders per service hour. And keep in mind, our target for the system is 18, so it's overperforming. This next slide here is a uh, bus shelter that we installed in front of ACOG at 42nd and Lincoln. Uh, Route 18 serves this location. And again, when you think of ACOG, and they're, they're really a partner with us in promoting public transit, they have a a lot of public meetings there, and so certainly a location where we felt we wanted to have uh, a bus shelter uh, to make it even more accessible to our customers. And then this uh, next location here, this is a uh, shelter that we just completed at Newview, and as if you're not familiar with Newview, they are a, uh, uh, a large employer of uh, individuals that, have, uh, that, are, that are visually impaired. And so um, they're a great partner of us. Uh, we have customers from Newview that use the uh, fixed route bus system as well as the uh, Embark uh, Plus service. And again, this is one of the recent shelters there at Newview. Um, here's an image of really a, uh, a work in progress. Uh, this is uh, Chartel Towers. Um, uh, I believe this is right off of, uh, well, right between Western and, and Chartel. Um, this is a senior uh, apartment complex, and basically what you see here is, you know, picture before versus the sidewalk that's been added, the shelter pad that's been built, and then we'll come back and we'll put a shelter in uh, to serve that location. Route 13 actually uh, provides a service to Chartel Towers. And then this location here, 4th and Walker, now we're looking at some bus stop uh, improvements that aren't necessarily uh, tied to new shelters. Uh, but again, here's a, here's a location at 4th and Walker, served by Route 38. And our uh, advertising uh, contractor has been working with us to uh, replace the benches in the downtown area from the concrete and wood plank bench that you see to the left uh, to a style that is permanently mounted to the concrete and is really more complementary of the P180 uh, look and feel that we see through downtown. So that's an ongoing project as we replace and upgrade the benches in the downtown area. Here's one at Maine and McKinley. Again, this is Route 9, but this is a concrete pad uh, that's just recently been completed. Uh, another one at 29th and Miller, both routes 11 and 12 uh, serve this stop. And then this particular location here is one of my favorite ones to talk about in that uh, this image that you see on the slide is one that we used uh, a couple of years ago when we were having community meetings to talk about the whole uh, Better Streets, uh, Safer City initiative and the 2017 Geo Bond. And we use this picture right here at Northwest 56 and Independence. You can see Integris there just in the background um, of a location that, that needed, uh, needed some work. It needed an improvement. And so the next slide here will show you that that work has been uh, completed. And uh, that's a result of those initiatives uh, passing and, and putting those dollars to work to, to make those improvements that we talked about in those community meetings. So in addition to the, the concrete pad, the, um, uh, the curb cut that you see there, you also see some pedestrian crossing signals have been added. And then the uh, last uh, shelter that we'll look at here, uh, Councilwoman Hammond was uh, kind enough to uh, help us out with a photo op there. So this is our 100th shelter, we're 100th new shelter, I should say. So we're pretty excited about that and at the 
conclusion of this presentation, we'll uh, leverage this uh, photo to um, broadcast this on uh, some social, different social media platforms. So, so with that, um, as you can see, we've certainly uh, uh, made some improvements to both bus bench uh, locations as well as shelters but thinking of shelters in particular we've added over as I mentioned over a hundred shelters now and so one of the things that's important to us is okay now that we're putting all these shelters out there we've made this initial investment in these assets how good a job are we doing in maintaining them which is basically keeping them clean keeping them mowed um, and so this is uh, data from our uh, most recent customer survey completed in February of 2019 and you can see that 66 percent of our customers uh, indicated that uh, the cleanliness of the shelters is good or excellent. We received a fair rating from 25% of the respondents, and then you know 9% gave us the below uh, below average score. But uh, I will say um, that probably our biggest challenge with getting these new shelters out there is the maintenance, and it's really just continuing to keep them clean, uh, keep the uh, the trash emptied, and and so forth. But uh, we're certainly pleased by the 66% overall uh, rating there. And so where do we go from here? Um, well, as we look into the next fiscal year, uh, we plan to continue to aggressively uh, add new shelters, uh, enhance existing bus stops. One of the resources that we're going to use, of course, um, and again, uh, to the credit of the planning department, public works, all those that are associated with uh, Bike Walk OKC, um, they've identified some transit priority areas and some pedestrian priority areas, uh, projects that will be uh, coming. And so anywhere uh, we are constructing um, sidewalks in those pedestrian and, and transit priority areas, anywhere where there's a transit stop, then that's going to be you know, obviously one of the areas we're going to want to make sure uh, we put uh, bu new bus shelters and, and bus benches. The other thing that we'll be looking at and that we always consider uh, when we uh, add new bus shelters is boardings. And right now our goal is to put a shelter at um, each location where boardings exceed 10 per day. Um, we also rely on direct feedback from customers. Often we do receive um, suggestions from customers on bus stop locations, but also you know, need, need for shelters. And then we also always look at specialty trip generators. You know, there are uh, occasions where maybe there's not 10 boardings a day, but because the stop is located, let's say, near a medical facility or maybe a senior living center, or maybe a school, those are also locations that we'll consider for bus shelters. So our goal next year is um, really to try to, to meet or exceed the number of shelters that we were able to install this year, which was 45. And again, we'll be working aggressively to do that. So again, just a quick presentation to kind of provide an update of where we are with our bus shelters, and we'll continue to move, move forward uh, installing them as quickly as we can. I just had a couple of questions for you. I hate to put you on the spot here. For the stops that we have that are closed and have bus shelters, are we replace, removing and putting those in, in higher traffic areas, or are they just going to stay closed and in shelter? Yeah. We <laughs> We plan to initially, I mean, eventually, I should say eventually relocate those shelters. But right now, the way, the way the shelter installation works is our contracted advertising vendor is the one that installs the new shelters. And so really, it's just a priority to us to make sure those resources are directing up putting the new shelters up versus relocating the old ones. Some of the old ones, depending on how they're constructed, cannot be relocated. So for the time being, we've just left them closed knowing that eventually we, I mean, we do need to address the ones that are still in the right of way that aren't being used. That, that's really, okay, we'll talk about that. Okay. But my other question though, um, the, the slide that you had with the bench upgrades on 4th and Walker, um, are we able to use those older benches and maybe put them at just some pole stops? Yeah, absolutely we can. Um, the, but again, when we, when we see a, a, a bus stop that just has a pole, we are, the COPPA Board of Trustees is committed to not putting a bench out unless it's ADA accessible. Um, thus the backlog, but it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. You know, we don't want to continue to put them out on uneven surfaces, grassy areas if we don't have to. 
So at this point, we're only putting additional benches out in ADA accessible lo or locations that we've made ADA accessible. So if there's not a sidewalk that's already in the area, but it's say it's a mid block stop, would putting a pad down and then putting a bench there be sufficient to meet those requirements or, or to meet the ADA, do we have to go further? Yeah, generally what, generally what we'll do is we'll have to connect a sidewalk to the nearest okay. intersection. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding this correctly. I believe I am, but it seems that um, 53% of respondents said frequency of the buses is a priority for them? Yeah, uh, when asked to rank the, t the top three, um, basically the top three uh, things that they think, or they wanna see in a bus system, uh, yes, frequency. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say before, about 15 minutes is about the frequency, the national kind of research standard of what would make a reliable public transportation system? Uh, yes, 15 is a, is a good frequency you see throughout the industry. And then bus, stop, bus shelters being another priority for people as well? Right, um, nearly a third of the respondents rank covered bus shelters as one of the top three things that would essentially allow, or you know, where they would consider using the bus system. And then the duration of their trip, that was the third. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say uh, thanks, Embark, for getting Councilwoman Hammond and I. Well, first, thanks for all you do. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Councilman uh, Greenwell, for serving on COPPA. Um, I like that. Thanks for getting Councilwoman Hammond and I out to the zoo. Oh, we, you we, guys <laughs> Good. we took the city buses up 4th Street to MLK. And I have to tell you, and we noted it on the way there and on the way back, that 4th Street up to MLK, Someone got on and off at every single stop. Our bus was never even close to empty, not one. I mean, so that just, that told us something about that. So, thanks. Well, I got one better for you because oh. <laughs> Jason and I rode on a Sunday, Route 22, that same route, and it was just as packed on a Sunday, so. It was, that was fun. It was pretty fun. <laughs> cool. Well, Thank I just wanna, are you, you done? I just, that stop at 56 and in Independence, like, that like, I'm like literally feel like I'm about to cry <laughs> because the number of times I've had to get off at a stop that looks like that and knowing that I'm like fairly mobile, or, but sometimes I have my bike with me and it's a very awkward uh, proposition, but just thinking how much that improves the experience of someone who does have a mobility device, who has a stroller from having to like stand in the street probably or somehow awkwardly get their like kids in a stroller up on that um, really strange incline. Um, it just is amazing, and I just, again, want to count, uh, echo Councilman Cooper, just thank you to embark um, every, I just, it, it's just amazing what you all have done um, with the limited resources that um, you have, so thanks for all your work on that. Thank you. Thank you, and much more to come on this topic over the summer, but a major effort in bus shelters is certainly a viable discussion point for MAPS 4, so. Good. Thank you. The next item we have is just our sales and use tax report. And I just want to point out, sales tax came in at 1.5% growth in uh, May, and it was on target. We had been projecting for it to be declining. And so going into next year, you know, we're about 3.5% underlying growth for sales tax for this year. But that expectation that we'll see slowing growth in the next year is what leads into our uh, projection for 2% growth on sales tax for next year's budget. Um, still, use tax is still strong. Um, and it's really what's pushed us over target for the year um, between sales, I mean, yeah, sales and use tax. Sales tax is really close to being on target for the year. Um, so we'll just keep monitoring that and report back to you. Okay. That concludes your reports. And if people want to look at claims and payroll, that's online where the agenda is at OKC.gov. We're now at item uh, 13, citizens to be heard. And we have Joy Reardon. Well, maybe we'll, Joy's in a conversation. How about Bill Patel? Okay, you wouldn't mind saying your name and address and keep your comments to three minutes or less, please. Jeff Neighbors, 3030 South I-35 Service Road, mm -hmm. 73129. Uh, we're here today because of a suggestion from the police department because of the neighbors next to our business. Uh, it's, it's really affecting our business and the police department's tired of going out there um, to their business as well. And that's why they've suggested that we come here and voice our concerns with the business next door to us. 
from all the riffraff that they have next door. Um, constantly crossing our parking lot to get to the business on the other side of us. Uh, we've had a staff member held up at knife point. We've had um, a staff member's car stolen with her children in the car. And we just constantly are, we're trying to clean up our property. We're actually remodeling it, re renovating it right now. But they're just not doing anything with, with the people they're allowing to stay at their property. So we wanted to be heard today that we're just tired of, of, of dealing with them and nobody's able to do anything about it. So we wanted our, our, our opinions on record for it. Um, it's the Plaza Inn next to the America's Best Value Inn. 3030 South I-35 Service Road. So you have one of those uh, hotels? We have the America's Best Value Inn, okay. and we're getting the problems from the Plaza Inn. Okay. We've spoken to the Denny's owner as well next to us on the other side. Um, they are getting a lot of riffraff and problems from the people that are staying at the Plaza Inn as well. Okay. And when the police department responds to us, like when we have to call on, on Plaza Inn's guests and stuff, they're telling us that Plaza Inn is not, they're refusing to trespass people. So they can't even do anything when they get there because they're not refusing to kick them out. They're not refusing to trespass them. So it's almost like they just have zero concern about who's staying in their property. Okay. Well, you want to follow up later with that? Uh Okay, and we've been in contact and sent most of our cor correspondence to Major John Stewart with one of the precincts. It is Santa Fe, yes. Okay. And that's all I had. Councilwoman Nice will definitely follow up with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicholas Turney. Sure. Come forward to state your name correctly and your address. Uh, Nicholas Turney. Uh, uh -huh. North, uh, North Penn, uh, one, 112th, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. I got a John Marshall. Okay. I'm uh, uh, in training for community leader. Okay. Welcome. Okay, thank you for being here today. Ronnie Kirk. My name is Ronnie Kirk from Ward 7. My address is 2328 North Missouri. Thank you, I'm good. On Easter Sunday, we had over 200 people come out to my Easter event for the kids on the northeast side of town. We had 100 parents dancing with the kids at one time. No teenagers, no 14, 15, 16 year old kids dancing with these kids. We had the the parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles. We started out going to let them dance three songs. They had so much fun with their, with their kids, they danced 30 minutes straight. And when I come down here today for May the second, I went to Doug Couple's office. Before Mick Cornette got out of the office, he set up an appointment with me at the Park and Recreation Department. The meeting went well with Mr. Copple. He said he would help me and reopen the area that we've been going to for 10 years. We started out on 4th and Martin Luther King years ago. They, excuse me. On Fort Martin Luther King, I'd rented restrooms, cleaned the area. We had fun there for 10 years until they started developing, which was first called Strangle Pearls. And after 10 years, they put a gate up down there. Didn't say keep out, stay out, nothing, just a, a locked gate. So we started going on 23rd and Sooner Road. For another 10 years, I had restrooms put down there. I had uh, rented them through Crossland Rental. I called the recreation department and they said, whatever you're taking 
the park areas take out. That's what we did for 10 years on 23rd and Sooner Road. The only time the city had to clean up behind us in 20 years at both areas was twice. Once when we, it rained on the 4th of July. So we wasn't able to get it. We started raining before we left out of the area. The next time, which was the, the, some teenagers came down there from the college. They had crates down there. They were going to make a bonfire. I sent my security over and told them, do not light that fire. I know what that meant. These teenagers were going to do on them college kids were going to do. They waited till we were leaving out, leaving out of the park and recreation area. And they lit that fire. Just so happened, the fire department for years had always parked close to the area because they know that I go down on holidays and some kids would shoot fireworks. And so the fire department was always somewhere close because they'd rather have a thousand people in one area than all over town shooting ball rockets all over the place. So they, they always worked with us. They had to come in uh, when them teenagers set that fire as we were leaving out. And, and in all the 20 years, the only time the city had to have that cleaned up was twice. We'd always took everything in there we took out. I put a letter that I wrote, Ron. Ron Ronnie, Ron, we're, at, we're at four minutes. Can you, yes, sir. can you wrap it up? I took a letter to Ron North 30 uh -huh. years ago, and that's the same letter y'all have y'all's information. Another thing we're finna start doing with our kids, we're gonna start, we're gonna all get together and bring our niece and nephew. We're gonna go downtown and ride these trolleys. It'll be a ride for our kids. None of them will never come across Broadway or a or, or, or class. They're all the way on that east side of town. So we're gonna make sure they go downtown, and this is be a ride to them. They can see all this development going on in Oklahoma City. Other than that, they will never see it again. They live in a seaside town. They're secluded over there. But we're going to make sure they get to see and enjoy some of this city. And we're going to check some of these older people that's out in these nursing homes that's related to us, that's dying, that don't, just homebound. We're going to start checking them out, those we can. And we're going to take them and let them enjoy this city before they're gone. All right. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thanks a lot. Joy Reardon. Hey, Council. I'm Joy Reardon, uh, 125 Northwest 9th. Uh, I live in Councilman uh, Six Ward. Mm -hmm. uh, what I come to come in front of y'all is the segways should be kept under the same guidance as the scooters. On Saturday or Sunday, I had a confrontation with the segway, which I asked the gentleman that's in charge of them if he could inform the people. Uh, the, uh, the fact that they're not supposed to ride on the sidewalk because they're actually larger than the little scooters we got uh, running around. You're talking about Segway Tours or our... Yeah, Segway okay. Tours. Okay. He said that uh, the city council, the police department and everything said it was okay for the, for the people to ride on the street or on the sidewalk. That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. <laughs> okay. Uh, the two major areas that I wish we could get the sidewalks is from Council Road to Eastern. It's broken up, and that is a major street that, um, that I see a lot of people go down. I would love to be able to go down and visit some of the businesses and patronize the businesses on Reno, which I cannot do. I literally have to be out into the street to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a broken, broken thing, and I would, and I'm planning on going to the, to the sidewalk meeting tomorrow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and the third one, the third thing, and I already talked it over. 
my councilman, council person, is I'm going to challenge, it's a two-part challenge to everybody on, on the city council. One is I would like to see for y'all to understand what the ADA standards are for y'all to spend 30 minutes in a wheelchair. The second part of that challenge is one day for everybody on the city council to ride the city bus, one day. Right of y'all's choosing, whether you choose uh, 11, five or the two big routes, or one of the others. Just one day, take and ride like everybody else on the city transit to get understanding of what the mothers, the fathers, uh, and all the working uh, people have to deal with with the city bus and the drivers, which I already know my council person already rides the city bus, and I do believe Mr. Cooper does too. But that's my two-pronged uh, challenge to everyone on the board, on the city council. All right. Well, thank you, Joy. Appreciate thank you. you. All right. That concludes citizens to be heard. We'll go into executive session for the item previously voted on, and we'll return and uh, possibly consider uh, item 9N1.